Okay, good evening. Uh, welcome to the September 8th uh, meeting of the Northampton Planning Board. Um, all of our meetings start off with an offer to accept public comments on anything that's not on the agenda. Um, anyone want to take advantage of that? Yes, sir. Can I get you to come up and I'll need your name and so you're on the record. <coughs> My name is Craig Wise and this is about 1250 West Hampton Road and you had guys had already looked at the A&R plan and there was some questions of illusory frontage so I went a couple of steps further and had the city engineer and my engineer come up with a plan they agreed upon for a driveway and also the DPW was in agreement for the site distance making sure there was enough site in both ways and also the crossing of the wetlands. Well, it, it sounds like you've done your due diligence. <clears throat> you would have to be on our agenda for us to vote on it tonight. Okay. And the only reason I was here is because Mr. Lewis Hasbrock had told me I would be able to sign in as other business, I guess, like so right now. So, staff, have you reviewed the? No, I mean, typically for A&Rs, we get them ahead of the meeting. Uh, typically we put them on, for, we have at least 48 hours notice to get on the agenda, but we need to review it to um, look at all the criteria yeah. to see if it qualifies. So, so we need um, some time to do that. And then, you know, if it makes sense, it could go on the next agenda. Do you have the site plan? No. I do. Well, that doesn't mean she's had time to review it. So in the same way that these people know that we're going to discuss certain topics and they want to talk about it, we need to go through the process of letting the public know that you're on the agenda. And Absolutely. I was just doing as I was told. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I w welcome to attend the rest of the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the first item on the agenda is a continuation of uh, public. Second item. Well, other business, you're right. Thank you. Um, no, the, the admin, I'm Day Abner. It's not a question. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Um, my apologies. Um, yeah. Um, I thought we would have taken the continuation first. Here. Um, it would just because. Um, this is just sort of an other business put up at seven. So okay. Just had them come. Um, other business is the first item on the agenda, request for screen modification for 69 Day Avenue site plan. Uh, is there a presentation or discussion of what's being asked for, or are you going to do that for the, the um, applicant? I don't, is there anybody here from the Day Avenue project? Okay. Um, so, um, if you recall, um, there were there were three units um, proposed at the at intersection, sort of the day and um, North Street, and um, the original plan showed on the rear lot line. I, I think you you received that in the staff memo. Um, originally, there was a row of arborvitae on the rear lot line. <coughs> the um, project development um, team during the course of construction decided they preferred to put a fence and then three maple trees um, and when it was brought to my attention I notified the property owner that um, in fact that should be reviewed by the planning board and approved so they were unaware of that process so the, the fence um, is up with the three trees so the request is an administrative modification to the treatment along that rear property line, and um, you you do have some correspondence from some of the abutters on some of the other streets about their concern about the change without permission, plus the change from green to a fence and, and maple trees. We don't in the zoning. Um, there's no requirement that there's that there be buffer screens between from one residential to use to another. There's really only a um, impervious screen requirement typically between commercial or um, disparate uses, commercial and residential or other uses that might have um, impacts particularly on residential uses. So um, I think in this case it's probably more of an um, aesthetic call or even um, in terms of um, value, you know, shade trees, some, some larger shade trees were taken down off of the property for construction. These are three new ones being planted to, um, they could 
offset those shade trees that were already taken off the site uh, for the construction. So can I clarify that the fence as it exists now is not counter to any zoning? It does, right. It's not inconsistent with any zoning. Okay. And, and of course, neither are the trees. So it's really just And the three trees are maple? Yes. Okay. Any thoughts? Well, the correspondence <coughs> we have is that that's a very big difference in terms of screening, that, you know, the difference between the arborvitae and the fence makes a big difference for neighbors. Um, I would have thought, I was under the impression that the approval would have said explicitly that any changes would need to come back to the board. I mean, I kind of am not so happy about that as an excuse that, you know, you, it, you know they did come and get approval and that's, you know, it's pretty poor form to decide to just make a change like that on a plan that we've approved. Um, it's, it seems more than minor that okay. someone would do that. Um, as that property changes hands into its future, are there any restrict? are there any, uh, what, what is the status of a fence or an arborvitae screen at that point? Well, um, once you're in, once your plan has been approved, you need to build what's on the plan that the board approved. And if there are modifications in the future, um, those need to, any changes would need to be requested. Either it could be so minor that they might be a staff level review, or if they're a little bit um, more significant, they could come back in front of the posted in, in front of the board on a posted agenda um, as a posted agenda item. Or the most the most dramatic changes would require a full scale amendment. So going through the application process, advertising, and that kind of thing. Um, this is I would say this is a site modification because if there's no requirement for a screen. Um, I think it's just a different treatment um, on one edge of the property. So in my opinion, it didn't need to be a full-blown amendment going, you know, um, on that level. So that's why it's here. So it is the fence that matches the other two sides. This, mm -hmm. is, this is a, whatever they did could have been done with neither the arborvitae nor a fence. It could have been left blank and been approved. Between two residential properties, okay. probably not right. in a commercial right. property. Okay. And I, I think if the first time around, had this been a fence instead of the arborvitae, I don't know that it would have generated any discussion since it wasn't required in the first place. And neither one was required. Right. And ultimately, I would take three trees over <coughs> arborvitae, you know, understanding that it's a different visual for the neighbors to have an instant green, um, you know, screen versus a fence. Uh, ultimately, I think trees would be better than the arborvitae. So. I yeah. don't have an issue. I'm still wondering if, if in future years, two owners down the road buys that house. You're going to check the deed, but you're not going to go back to site plan information to even. I, I just find that unlikely that that's what people. To do what? To replace the fence or to. If, if you uh, wanted to make any changes to something that was mm -hmm. put in the site plan as transactions of, re of real estate occur over time, I don't know how that keeps up with that. Alan, do you have any? Not at all. That's what I'm thinking. It, it wouldn't seem unlikely. I could build a fence between myself and the next door neighbor now, and it would have no impact at all. None. Yeah. Any the other letter comments? we got, oh, I'm sorry. No. The letter we got refers to a 12 foot fence. I, I assume that's hyperbole. I mean, um, it's not literally 12. I looked and it certainly didn't. I mean, it's not 12 feet, right? No. The panel itself, no, it could be the perception or the effect because there is a slight grade change from one property to the next. So I don't know if that's, uh, I assume that's what they, the, uh, It is the, the same fence that's on the other two sides. That's what right. I come from today. Mark, Dan. Okay, so the issue before us is to um, allow the modification to the site plan, you called that an administrative? Right, because it's not a, yeah, an administrative amendment. An administrative amendment. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor? Are we allowed to make um, Yes, of course, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it, it was um, actually my gaffe. No problem. Um, I'm Steve Isles. I wrote the letter um, about the 12-foot fence. Um, I'm along 48 Sherman Avenue. Um, the reason it's a 12-foot fence is because the land is actually graded 
six feet higher on Day Avenue than on Sherman Avenue. So there is a fence on my next door neighbor's property, which is then topped by another fence um, by about six feet. Um, I did send around a letter with the pictures mm -hmm. um, before and after. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest issues is that behind this fence, well, one of the biggest issues is that it was offered to us as a beautiful replacement of these green trees that have been there for years um, with at least an arborvitae hedge that would give us some screening um, from this very new building. Um, and when the fence went up, um, it was very shocking to begin with. And now what we have is um, Japanese knotweed, which is growing. I'm sure you're aware it's completely invasive. So it's beautifully covering the fence right now. But what is going to happen in the winter is it's all going to die back and fall down, and we're going to be left with this stark fence again. So um, that's my concern, as, as it's pretty ugly out there right now. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else have a comment about the <clears throat> Day Avenue property? Hi. Hi there. Jerry White, and I'm at 32 Sherman. Um, my view out my window, my beautiful kitchen window, is now the fence. No greenery, you know, no trees, no privacy for our driveway, Steve Isle's driveway. His backyard is completely wide open now, and there were trees that buffered his whole property that are gone. Um, I don't understand why they built these three condos. Why can't they buy 12 aprovites or 12 something that will give us some greenery? We're looking at modern condominiums in an old neighborhood, um, agreed to, approved, granted, but I don't understand why with the money that was paid to build this huge property, why can't they just comply and do what the plan said and put these aprovites up? That's all we're asking. It's not a lot of money. It's a principle on their part, I feel, because they don't want to do it. And that's bad neighborhood. You know, that causes bad feelings. End of story. Thank you. You're welcome. Mark? I don't keep the fence, keep the trees, but add the arbor body on the back side of the fence. There must be space, huh, on the back? Well, well, if there isn't, like if there room. isn't, I don't know if they can pull it back enough to, They'd have to, to allow the that. Fence. On the one hand, I think eventually we'll like the maples. I mean, I think I, I'm very partial to maples as, a, as opposed to exactly. I see I see the point of that, and I think that's a uh, a fair request. Yes, sir. Hi, um, Hi. my name is Chris Seymour, and I live on 48 Sherman Avenue. Um, I think the problem is a they didn't stick with a plan that was agreed upon that all the neighbors saw and said, you know, this is pretty modern. But I guess we'll, you know, okay, fine. We're gonna have a screen and it's gonna be green. We had a beautiful area with trees back there and they're gone. Those maples, we can't see. They're in behind the fence for us. We yep. only see a wall right. from every window from our backyard, from our windows from our back of our house, in our backyard, there's no privacy, none. So I think that that's, our main concern is we had a private backyard. Mm -hmm. This is an old neighborhood. We're very close together, but we all have a lot of privacy, and now we don't. Right. Um, you know, people can look straight into our backyard. People can look straight into our our house. It's not comfortable. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike Goggins, 69th Day Avenue, here to take the hit. We apologize. Uh, about the uh, fence issue in terms of fence versus arborvitae. Uh, Can I get you to the microphone? That's not us. Um, so we apologize, first of all, to these folks. A uh, um, couple things. It's, uh, it's, there's six-foot sections of fence. It is true that on the back side of the house, which faces Sherman, uh, the, that the property slopes dramatically downward. Uh, so there's, there's, there is a slope to contend with there. But the, uh, the fence all the way around is a six-foot section of the fence. Not to uh, you know, go back over past ground because it's been decided, and you'll find in our file for this thing originally, there was the trees that were in the back were all deeply compromised, and there's a, a documentation from C.L. Frank in terms of what the future of those trees was, and it wasn't pretty. Uh, it wasn't pretty at all. 
So as part of the part of the project, that was in, that was uh, attended to. Uh, you know. So uh, again, uh, the the fence provides a a more complete buffer than any roller everybody's ever would. I get that it's not green. It will be green. There's three right now, almost 20 foot high red maples there. We know how big those get. Uh, so um, I'm here to tell you that you know we're sorry about it. the first we heard about the concern was when we got the thing in the mail here of, of, of mid late summer. Uh, but it uh, it was it was it was uh, it was done as a buffer. We viewed it as an improved buffer. I think it is an improved buffer. You can't see uh, through the fence. You can see through arborvitaes, and that goes both ways. If that was if that was the case, and not now you can't do that. Um, we ran it along the back line, uh, pretty much exactly. In fact, where where the where the site plan had called for the buffer to be. It's just a different form of a buffer, still with trees. So. Sorry, it's on us. I, we, we'd ask, we're not, we're, we'd ask, you know, your your support to to uh, to uh, not include any further steps regarding that. There's uh, much was done, uh, and uh, you know, we apologize again for the uh, for the folks who are displeased with the way it looks in the back. Uh, but I think the scope of this hearing is pretty narrow. It's about whether or not, right? Tonight it's pretty narrow scope uh, on, on the thing. So I, I don't necessarily want to broaden it out more than we have to, but. Um, that's how we feel, and uh, the final unit closes Tuesday. And, uh, six good people, and it's going to be a, a good, a good neighbors. We've got support from the folks. A couple of them sent you, a, I think, an email today to your attention. Some of the neighbors uh, today, you'll see that. Uh, not in my garage is next door, but there it is. Uh, so I'd like to confirm. You mentioned that the tr the fence is on the property line. So do you have any option? That the planting arborvitae behind that? Any options to? Plant arborvitae behind that? Um, the gentleman is correct. It's not Weed City back there right now. Uh, that, that is what's there. The, uh, the, the, the line is very close to the fence at the sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the far corner. If I had it. You got your, you got your drawings there? Oh, it's, it's the Coca-Cola side, side or the other side? Uh, the, 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 lot line is, the lot line is close to the fence at a point in time and then fans a little more uh, deeper away from the fence as it goes down that hill we've described in back, if you can all picture that. Uh, it gets, uh, the, but the lot line gets pretty tight on an angle up to, the, uh, up to where the fence is. <coughs> is, on our, on our is there enough depth on the back side of the fence to plant arborvitae? I have no, I have no, I'm not in a position to respond to that. I don't, it seems quite slopey, but I'm not, that's not my, that's not my world. Slope aside, just depth wise, where the property line is versus the, versus the fence as it fans away, is there enough depth there to plant? I, I can't, I just can't answer that. That's mm -hmm. not what my world is. I don't know, not, not my field. Any other thoughts? Yeah. You I'm not clear on the, Trees that are there now. Did, did you say 20 foot trees? No, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're no, they're they're a good 15 feet. I, I watered them today. It's way more than a basketball hoop, and that's 10 feet, so it's probably close to 20 feet now, from, from where it sits. And there's three of them, uh, positioned, boom, 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 right along the back. So those you planted when you took, when you built the project. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they're evenly spaced. Yes. In the back. Yes. The, the tree shown on the plan was pre-existing, that's larger, it's set I in. Look at it. No, those, those are, those, those, there's the fence, and those are, those are the that's, that's new, that's new. Those are new, we planted, I guess, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five or six, and another tree on the way in front. Those three are, those are the three on our fence. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts? I think Mark had the best suggestion of all. I mean, it, you know, I think it's just, it, we approve the plan for a reason and we give permission and to come ask for forgiveness, I would rather see it be, rather see us find some way that it accommodates the neighbor's concerns. What um, I'd like to know is, I think it's uh, to ask staff to explore whether it is possible legally if there are enough room to plant the arborvitae that on the other side of the fence. 
Well, I mean, um, I mean the alternative to that is you own the fence, you move the fence, and you plant it anyway. Right. 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 I, mean, I think I think the conditions can be accommodating if there's room, then you put it, and if there's not, you take the fence down or move it, and that just forces something to happen. The arbor body to go in either way. I have a couple of thoughts. One, the, the possibility of having being able to plant arbor vitae the whole way seems pretty slim. I mean, who knows? I, somebody would have to go back there and find the property line, see how much room there is. And planting a part way would look even worse, I would think. Um, and, and number one, and number two, I, I think what I think you said, Devin, that um, in the long run, the maples will look much better and provide much more screening. The Arbor Vitae are, are, are not going to provide much privacy, no privacy. Um, the maples will provide much more privacy to the neighbors and to the uh, people in the, that buy the houses. So I... He, well, I, I would say that... Uh, um, you know, sort of thinking you all approve plans for the future as, as um, Alan was just mentioning and typically when you're planting an arbor um, vitae it's it's going to be five or six feet upon planting so it's not going to be any taller than the fence and um, those once those maple trees do crown and grow taller they're going to be there'll be the screen above the fence so it'll be it'll um, provide that sense of buffer that then was taken down with cutting the trees. So For six months, yeah. or eight months, whatever it is. I mean, it's. I still. I mean, I think the, the fundamental. And I'm not. Sh I mean, it's a. I think it's public comment still. I don't yeah, know. Public comment it's still. It's not so officially a public hearing, so it's it's okay. more. It's less formal. I mean, it's. It seems like there is the principle that it wasn't done clearly it was you know the planting a, a long row of arborvitae is expensive <laughs> but i think that's probably why it wasn't done it should be done um, i actually think the trees in the fence probably cost them more to tell you the truth um, i looked into it it's not too long either ago. either way but the choice to not there is no i think don't think there's a further cost issue it should have been done to begin with they may have wasted the money on a fence that's really not our problem with what they chose to do the arbor body should still go in this plan could have been approved with no buffer is that right right there's not a screen required the issue as i'm saying i don't know that they would have even had this discussion before but we, never, we weren't able to have this discussion because we're talking about two different things. And so because I think that's the easiest thing, it was a mistake, honest mistake. I get that mistakes are made, but it, it affects the neighbors. The neighbor, we approved a plan that the neighbors signed off on, which include a, a green screen. So keep the fence, keep the trees, and just give them, give them the arborvitae that the plan showed. And if you can't plant as shown, because originally it had it going all the way across the boundary line not halfway or whatever and so if you have to move the kick the fence in a foot to do that then kick the fence in but that'll give the, the neighbors the green screen that'll give the owners the trees and everybody wins and it's a mistake that they pay for by putting the arborvitae back up well i guess there's a question I, I mean i don't mean to be advocating for the developers but uh, we don't know whether moving the fence in far enough to allow the planting of arborvitae would require digging up the trees. Uh, to me, it seems like a solution that'll make it worse. Any other thoughts? Well, I'll say I'm bothered that what we agreed to did not happen. I think that's what the people expect us to go through and do. So I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uncomfortable with uh, requiring something that would not have been required in the first place but we did go through the process of planning the the three new houses and the neighbors came and they talked to us and they were expecting a green screen so 
Um, I'm, I think what we ought to do is take two votes. One is the first would be a consideration of whether this, the fence modification uh, as requested for um, uh, if, if, if we can get a vote that says yes or no to the fence as it, as it exists now. So then we would reconsider whether ask for information on whether a, an arborvitae addition to the back of the fence can happen. Because I'm, I'm with Alan. You, I mean, what you could do is sort of simplify that and just um, take a vote on whether or not the green screen should be there, and then the applicant or the owner can figure out how to do that. Okay, and this is to give you, you will actually determine whether the green screen can go behind the fence. Well, I, I mean, I think the um, I think it's up to the um, property owner to determine to make those measurements and uh, consult with their landscape architect mm -hmm. and see Doesn't if that will work. Fence at all. Yep. Right. Yeah. Right. Don't need the fence, and I think that the, the screen wasn't a requirement, requirement, but it became a requirement once we approved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once it was shown and it was approved as such, and so fence wasn't a requirement so it doesn't need to be there but the arbor body needs to be there so if you put it behind the fence everybody wins you have to move the fence in it's a pain but everybody wins again you have to take the fence down so and they certainly could take the fence down that could be part of it and they can take away the three maples there's no guarantee that those stay those weren't part of the original right. so I think I that's that's not the case but yeah anyway. um, okay um, any other comments from the public Okay. Um, isn't there a law that your fence has to be three feet inside your property so that it's a barrier on the other side for a lawn mowing to say that's my property? No. No? Because that's what the fence people told me when I put my piece up. Ah. Okay. <laughs> that. Um, okay, so I think we are now ready to vote. Um, so. Uh, we're presenting a request for the screen modification for 69 Day Avenue uh, site plan. Uh, all those in favor of the modification, which would be the, s the fence would be okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I haven't been here in a while. Oh, Help me. Ann Brooks made the motion. Second. John seconds it. All in favor? Just to confirm, we're saying the fence. The, the motion up. is to is to allow the fence as an amended uh, modification. The amendment being the addition of the arborvitae. Are you doing this a two vote thing? No, I'm I think confused what on what you're. No. I think I, I, it sounds like the motion would be to approve the fence, and if their motion fails, then. Then you move on to the next. Then thing. no. Then well, you, go you can reverse to, it and say then you that. You go back to yeah. what was planned originally. I mean, yeah. Yeah, there would be right. no need for a then, second vote. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would just the existing plans as approved mm -hmm. stand. That's right. Put the green. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody clear on this? I'm sorry for my muddling. Okay. Yeah, hasn't been seconded. So the motion is John to seconded the motion it. Is to approve, which John said. Right. Yes. Okay. All in favor? One, all opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, now we move on to uh, Mark. You need to recuse yourself from the. You can open it first. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, it's a continuation. The, the, yeah. As it stood, stood. Oh. Or what if this guy wasn't yeah. the white person who. Asked, may not be here. I'm sorry. No. Yeah, I think it's a safer bet, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the second item on the agenda, public hearing continuation. Uh, Carolyn notes that we did not previously open this because we did not have quorum of a special permit and site plan and residential unit by New Harmony Properties LLC at 121 Hinkley Street, Florence Map ID uh, 23D-149. So while they're setting that up, let me 
for my benefit and yours, I get, get my steps straight here. So we will get a presentation so that we know what we're talking about at the, at the property. Uh, we will ask them some questions so that we understand the design of the property. I'll open it up for public comment and any of you can come up just like we did in, in the previous item. State your name. Uh, these are recorded for a reason for open meeting law and to let other people review these if they need to. And uh, then I'll close the public hearing. Once everyone's had their chance to, we'll, we'll listen to whomever wants to give us an opinion. And then we'll close public hearing so that we then are discussing among ourselves. Um, and then we'll take a vote on, on the uh, plan. Um, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Jonathan Wright from New Harmony Properties. Can you hear all right? Um, on the screen is a uh, just a rendered site plan. Uh, we'll go into the details in the presentation. But first, a few general remarks. I wanted to thank all of the members of the board and the community members who are here for coming tonight. And to thank the board for your service to the community in this way. It's very important and much appreciated. Hinkley Trace is a project of New Harmony Properties. My wife, Meg, and I are the principals of that. Um, and is planned to be built by Wright Builders here of Northampton. We're representing information, presenting information here and designs regarding the site plan review and special permit applications which were filed in good order, continued and updated from August 11th. In that time, um, the DPW comments that were incoming before the hearing that was continued have been included. So we have the rare pleasure of offering you filed now uh, plans that have all of the DPW comments. Project goals are to create smaller one floor active and passive solar residences suitable for a range of ages in a moderate ownership price range close to Northampton and Florence and major employers as well as recreation. Orient all buildings within 15 degrees of solar south with shaded windows for year-round comfort and long-term sustainability. Provide for owned or leased active PV systems for all homes to the extent possible within utility tariffs. Targeting net positive energy annually for each unit. Eliminate basements in favor of habitable space, loft storage, entry porches, private patios, garages for bikes, cars, and gear. Provide a location that is a small scale destination, big enough to be managed as a condominium, but small enough to be friendly and low key. One story buildings fading downgrade from the street to introduce minimal disruption of the view corridors. Landscaping that is extensive and detailed and focused on drought tolerant and native species. Two and three bedroom configurations with universal design. A design concept that responds to the city's infill zoning while representing aspects of the neighborhood design history and architecture. The process so far uh, is as follows. This site appeals to us because it is infill, infill proximal to services and transportation. We looked at plans that suggested everything from six to over 20 units. We reached out for an early and voluntary community meeting with more than 70 people with a 10 unit plan that was met with some resistance as well as incomplete information. A healthy discussion ensued for more than two hours. Instead of 10 units, we have now proposed eight slightly larger units. Eight units are allowed by right in this location in the street front duplex array of four buildings, which we do not think is particularly beneficial to the neighborhood in that it creates too much of a wall of buildings and driveways. Nor does this orientation provide for the solar performance or the sunlight needs <coughs> of the neighborhoods. It is neither sustainable nor handsome. We want to do something better, but we would not need to be here at all if I was willing to do a more intrusive and less sustainable project. What we will show you this evening is a project of four duplexes such that each home has its own patio porch and outdoor living area. Each building has two homes of 1,000 and 1,236 square feet respectively. Common areas for act active resident outdoor enjoyment and participation including seating and birdhouses for, lo uh, for local species, not just grass seed on unused land. A graded site that works with existing terrain. 
a plan that preserves border trees wherever possible and adds planting where needed and border plantings to the greatest degree that still projects, protects the existing plants and trees. A comment from <coughs> a traffic professional that clearly indicates minimal traffic impact from this project. A sophisticated stormwater management system that will advance the current state of water infiltration and mitigation. A plan that can be built to the current road condition but which anticipates the eventual or likely reconstruction of Hinkley Street. A garage array, array that is partially buried, rendering it minimally visible from the street. Architecture as a result of a design competition among four respected local architects that is compatible with the mixed and eclectic nature of the larger neighborhood. And a planting plan that is robust and responsive to neighbors and residents alike. A project whose home sizes meet or exceed the affordability requirements of the city zoning. Homes whose HERS ratings are pre-solar will meet or exceed all the requirements uh, for, uh, for those ratings. Homes whose solar arrays, to the extent allowed by utility tariffs, again, will provide a path to net positive annual power usage. Off-street parking of one outdoor and one garage per home. Dark skies compliant outdoor lining for minimal light pollution contribution. So we look forward eagerly to comments and input as well. We hope you, you, we, we hope we will show you a project that is innovative, handsome, livable, and meets all of the criteria for the permits before us tonight. Terry Reynolds is gonna lead off, and then uh, Charles Roberts will make some brief comments on the architecture, and Jeff Squires from Berkshire Design will comment on the landscaping. Okay, uh, any questions for Mr. Roberts? <coughs> yes, sir. Did Hinkley Trace start out as Hinkley Terrace? Mm -hmm. You saved money on letters? <laughs> well, it was, it was placed. What does it mean? What does Trace mean? Yeah. Ah. Ah. I'm just curious. Has yeah. It well, it's there? one of those words like rill, and um, uh, that it, it's an old English word that means a path uh, created by the passage of humans and animals. Oh. And it's right. the origin of the word when you say they disappeared without a trace. It means they didn't leave a path. We we think it's the trace, the other kind, but it's actually what it's actually a physical thing. So, being well, a being an English kind of person, I'd appreciate a couple of comments. You made a statement that eight units were could be built by right. So explain the reason that you're here with the site plan as opposed to talking to the planning office directly. So um, Terry will go into this in more detail. Ah, but okay, it, that'd be it's fine. It's a two hundred and four feet of frontage there. Mm -hmm. So under the new zoning that can divide it into four uh, frontage lots, each of which can have a narrow up-down duplex, each of which needs its own driveway. So what you end up with is um, you know, 15 feet house, 15 uh, uh, um, driveway, 15 feet house, driveway, 15 feet house, driveway, stacked up. So um, you know, it's, it's allowed, yep. but not, not, uh, does not make good use of the site. and is not sustainable for people or humans. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. My name's Terry Reynolds. I'm here for T. Reynolds Engineering. And um, so I'm just going to go through the approval <laughs> criteria um, and sort of where, how this developed. Um, basically, we started out with a site here where we have a uh, a house that was in very ill repair right here and a fallen down garage here and what used to be uh, a pasture um, was now overgrown with invasives and, and all kinds of debris all over all over the property um, and so as a result um, we came in and we took down this house the house had degraded to such a point that it, it had no salvageable value um, and took, took the garage down also um, and then cleaned up the entire site. Um, and this is a picture of what, what the house was. Um, the roof had been, had failed for many years and had water running through the building. This addition over here was built with two by fours sideways um, and was structurally not worth anything. Um, as you can see, the garage back here, this was an old milk house. This was the original Dostal home. Um, and uh, this had all been allowed to just fall into 
absolute disrepair and was really a blight on the whole neighborhood. Um, so now this is this is a, a depiction of what could be done by right. Um, four buildings with individual driveways, um, one over the other, um, and that you know that you could do that and sell off each of the lots. And, there you have it. And so this was a thought process going through what, what could be done with this. Um, so this is one option. Another option is zero lot line development um, with um, you know, single family houses side by side. Um, and then you get into more options of, of nine units and similar, similar ideas. Um, and here's one with 12 units. Um, again, same sort of thing. Not very desirable, um, would not have very much attractive benefit to them. Um, and so through, through the um, architectural um, uh, exercise that Jonathan did, we came up with, Coon Riddle came up with this design of five units, five, five buildings and 10 units. And then, then what was ideal about this is is it allowed for this unit to kind of be sitting up and prominent and all the remaining units are depressed down in the lower area with garages that were also depressed um, and basically a nice flow to the site in private areas with connectivity to the street and so on. Um, after a public meet, uh, community meeting that we performed, um, it was determined that this felt too much. Um, so what we ended up with was four buildings, eight <laughs> units, which allowed the, the, built, the site to be spread out better, allowed for more um, design availability, um, better landscaping ability, and so on. Um, so this is where we're at now. Uh, and so we're here for a special permit site plan approval. Um, and so as part of that, the special permit criteria, um, we're looking for um, basically that we're not going to have detrimental um, effects on the on adjoining properties and so on. No, I keep the company. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and so in doing so, we've designed a stormwater management system um, using rain gardens um, with extensive plantings around the site trying to use non-invasive plants and providing buffers between the properties so that um, we have um, visual buffering along with sound buffering of, of whatever is going on. Um, and the, the idea is this has been done in a way that allows plenty of light into the units, doesn't and is intended not to be an impact to our, the, the neighbors. Uh, you know, as minimally as possible. Um, and so the second one is, is to promote the safety and convenience for pedestrian use. So in, in the site plan, you'll see that there are sidewalks throughout. Um, with the Hinkley reconstruction, a new sidewalk is being put in on the east side of the road that the sidewalks will connect to. Um, uh, and the vehicle we have parking for two spaces for each unit, which is desirable and actually is required um, through the zoning. One space in a garage, one space outside. Um, and then uh, we have a harmonious relationship <coughs> of structures and open spaces. Basically, that's, that's how we fit the buildings into that site with using, utilizing the existing terrain to the maximum extent possible having the houses set down below so the visual effect of them is going to be minimal from the street. Um, so um, in terms of number four, um, impacts to the city's resources, uh, there's capacity in the sewer. We're pumping up to the new sewer that's going to be built in Hinkley. Um, the stormwater management on site is exceeding the, the standard. We're actually reducing the stormwater runoff on the site. Um, and additionally, we're dispersing it um, in, in, in redispersing it so that basically it's going to reduce 
um, flooding impacts to the adjoining properties also. Um, and uh, it's, it's worth noting here that uh, when you come down Maplewood Terrace now, um, Hinkley Street slopes to the north to a catch basin area that's uh, between Laura's property and this property. That overloads regularly. That There is a uh, storm drain underneath the, an easement that runs through there. It is uh, not in good repair. And so that area is regularly flooded as a result of normal street events. And when the Hinkley Street reconstruction is done, that gets picked up and that Maplewood uh, water it goes the other way. So the water that has been uh, plaguing this neighborhood comes from street water, not from this property. Well, no. Substantially. I mean, well, th there's an issue. The, the existing stormwater system overloads and floods across Laura's property right. as it sits now. And it's possible with leaves that it will continue to happen. But in general, this storm line that goes, it goes through Laura's property and behind this property and down to Federal Street. This storm line, the loading on it's been reduced because the city's going to reroute most of, basically all of what comes down Maplewood Terrace is going to now go east down Hinkley Street. Um, so that, that loading on this system will be reduced significantly. Um, and so we're, we expect that this, the, the, what I was saying about this site though is right now there's a lot of runoff that just is overland runoff from the yards that this site and, adja and adjoining yards contribute to the down gradient yard areas. And by developing these rain gardens and such, we will be reducing that runoff through the rain gardens um, and dispersing it further out of, out of the more flood prone areas. Um, so that should be a benefit in that regard. Um, the, the request needs to meet um, special regulations set forth in the chapter. The, we have special regulations in terms of site plan approval, needing to have 25% um, of the units under 1,200 square feet, um, using the, um, uh, uh, what is our energy efficiency? HERS rating. Our HERS rating, meeting, meeting low HERS ratings for these units, um, having buildings uh, that front the street and face the street um, and uh, so on. So we, we've dealt with addressing those issues um, and uh, I'll go through that in, in just a minute. Um, in terms of uh, a positive relationship of convenience or welfare, the use of uh, integrity of the character and joining, this is part of the, the research we did in terms of de designing units that are compatible um, and consistent with what is in the general neighborhood, and we believe we've done that pretty well. Um, and then uh, it promotes the city objective of infill, and I think this does it very well in terms of we are pr proposing units that are net zero units that are spaced basically one building um, on just over a quarter acre. Uh, and making the best use of the land we can and providing, um, you know, very quality, high quality housing. Um, so, uh, additional criteria is a level of service for traffic. We have submitted a traffic impact statement. Uh, the, the project um, based on the city trip generation, if you figure we've got one building that was already there, we're generating seven trips during the peak hour. Um, very minimal. Um, and the traffic counts out there, and the traffic flow in the neighborhood is very low also. Uh, uh, access uh, non-motorized. Basically, we have bicycle storage either in the garages or on the porches. Um, curb cuts have been minimized. We have one entrance to the whole site. Um, and then pedestrian vehicular move movement is separated with sidewalks. Um, and we have a green infrastructure, low, pack, low impact design, um, wherever we can. So this is a site plan um, with our four units, rain gardens here and here. Um, we have a meditation area with a stone pathway to it, um, with two, two benches, 
stone stone bird bird uh, bath and uh, multiple feeders will be out here and then these are all going to be planted in um, meadow mix and so on which Jeff will will talk about in a little bit um, our grading design the grading design for this is intended to again try and mimic what's basically here um, with the rain gardens and um, and, and the existing contours. Uh, it's, it may, may be worth noting that um, interior to the property, there is a parking court uh, with the garages facing in, so that uh, the uh, by and large, the neither the neighbors nor the residents are facing uh, asphalt any more than is necessary. Right. Um, utility plan. We're, we've got um, gravity sewer to a pump station. Sewage is going to be pumped back up to the street. Um, it's a duplex unit with an emergency uh, storage tank on it. It'll allow for a day's storage if the power goes out. Um, then we have basically uh, divided water service for each unit. And then it's going to be the solar, solar um, system on here with transformers and solar on, on each unit. Right now, the current tariff uh, allows the utility to restore um, uh, bi-directional meters, net meters, to uh, 20,000, uh, 20 kW per transformer. So although this project could be easily serviced with a single transformer, we will be putting in four or five uh, in order to do that. This is a utility tariff that is designed uh, to discourage um, sustainable activities. Um, something else I'm going to tell you about. Come back. Oh, the, in terms of water usage, these are all uh, specified as one gallon per flush, which is the lowest level that we have that will be uh, supported by warranty, lowest level of water flow. All right. Okay. And I'm going to let Jeff take it from here. Actually, me. Actually you're all right. Oh, okay. You can come back. Sure. Just two. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick. Six minutes, something? Six minutes. Thank you. All right. Six minutes. Four minutes. Is that all right? Yeah. Sorry, it's a little lengthy. <clears throat> so I am Charles Roberts, Kuhn Riddle Architects. I'm really happy to be working with uh, Jonathan and Terry on this project. And um, I thought I'd start off this evening just by giving you a really quick tour of the Hinkley Street neighborhood, a sort of refresher on the context of the uh, of the project that we're, that we're proposing, kind of a view looking south up the street, um, a little further south, our sites on the on the left there. So you know, as Jonathan mentioned, this is an eclectic neighborhood of turn of the century Victorians and farmhouses, a number of bungalows, and. Um, variety of post-war ho homes that include several single-story ranch houses. Um, I, the one thing that all these houses have in common is that, um, you know, they have, they create a real strong sense of place, pride in the neighborhood, uh, well-kept gardens, beautiful yards, and they create a feeling of houses that are really nestled in to the, uh, to the streetscape. Um, welcoming, yet secluded, landscaped entries, um, porches, Pocket gardens, varied plantings, you know, lush landscape, beautifully set back, and there's a, there's also a really interesting range of these sort of newer uh, post-war ranch houses, which are you know low profile. They really snuggle into the landscape um, nicely. Um, they 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 become secondary to the landscape in a lot of ways, and they just become uh, they sort of tucked in and become the inspiration for what we were looking at here. Um, when Jonathan said he wanted to look at um, single-story uh, living, um, you know, driving through the neighborhood, the the idea of starting to create this ranch-style architecture, um, sort of with a with a with a mid-century sort of um, sort of feel about them, really seemed like an appropriate way to go. Um, we uh, we're drawing on the language again of the uh, mid-century houses that we've just seen, um, low-slung roofs, PV on the south. Um, this is an overall plan of, of a typical duplex. It comprises a, uh, a, a two-bedroom unit and a three-bedroom unit. Um, each unit has a private covered entry porch, private fenced-in yards, um, patio areas. 
the uh, the living areas are sort of mirror images of each other the main living areas and then the uh, the bedrooms and bathrooms and private areas off to the north of the building um, sort of vary as the two and three bedroom layouts um, dictate um, the elevations um, we're using durable fiber cement siding clapboards board and batten um, triple glaze casement windows we have uh, opposing um, gables here, the, a 4 and 12 to maximize exposure to the, to the south for PV, um, a steeper 6 and 12 pitch roof uh, to the north for drainage and, uh, and uh, snow buildup. Um, this, this shows uh, sort of, a, of, a, of a one idea about a color scheme, but we're going to be varying the color schemes throughout the four buildings to sort of create variation um, within the neighborhood. This is a, uh, a quick view um, of the site from the northeast. Um, a lot of these um, sort of hitting on a lot of the ideas that Terry talked about. This um, does this mouse help at all? No, it doesn't. So the you know you can see the building up in the the upper uh, the upper uh, portion of the site. That's where the existing house was, and that's the, and then the the houses just sort of flow down with the existing topography. There's about a 10 foot drop um, in the main central driveway from the street down to the uh, the parking area where the garages are. So. The garage has really become tucked back in um, from the site and uh, hidden from the street. Um, this is a view from the southwest, and again, you get an idea of the private entry porches and gardens, the uh, the open spaces, uh, park park areas, which uh, increase light and view and airflow throughout the site. Um, so again, these are just a, a few quick views of, of the buildings. Um, Again, just that that low slung kind of look tucked into the landscape. Um, private entry porches, uh, patio, gardened patios, um, and uh, really trying to just create a neighborhood that and, and, and a development that, that fits in and is sympathetic to uh, you know to the Hinkley Street neighborhood. And we feel this is a, a really great a really great effort. Thank you. So let's see. I'm going to escape from here. So you need to Jeff, you just minimize. So I'll try to be real brief. Uh, Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group. Um, we're landscape architects on the project. Um, and again, as, as Jonathan alluded to uh, and Charles, um, just the, the goal of this project was really to try and uh, make the spaces that these structures and uh, the placement of, of these buildings um, as functional as possible. So maximizing the open space, utilizing some of the rain gardens for other functions other than just being stormwater detention. Um, and so, um, you know, back up before I get into that. The, so the, the planting palette is, is robust. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, it's got a variety of species native. Um, there are some specimen plantings in there where appropriate. Um, accenting building corners, softening, um, softening the hard structures. There's some retaining walls that we've, you know, we've utilized and, and rolled in with the landscape again to try and capture some private space that is, you know, both private but you know open to open to the air. Um, as I mentioned in the rain garden, what we've tried to do is rather than um, uh, maintain it as a, as a simple rain garden, is is run a path through the center of it to to an area that's. Um, raised up at, at the far end of the property, the back side of the property. Um, there's some room there for some diverse plantings. Again, the, the concept is really to uh, make this setting, you know, a real natural environment, a, a native, um, native environment that attracts birds and some other species. So it's a place that, again, isn't just used for stormwater, that it can be used for, um, you know, a, a small, you know, cup of coffee in the morning or, or something other than your private backyard. Um, it's really to try and create, you know, another space on the property that, that the residents can go that, you know, isn't far off the property. Um, again, sidewalks and a real attentiveness to each um, the private spaces. Um, the seed mixes that we've got in, um, in this plan are more than your stereotypical sort of New England wetland seed mix. Um, there's some specialty seed mixes from the Midwest that are really designed for this sort of purpose. 
um, wildlife diversity, um, rain garden environments, wet soils. Um, and so, you know, we really hope that this will add a lot of color and a lot of diversity to the plan. Um, a variety of sedges and, um, you know, grasses and, again, just a variety of, of plants to really provide some, um, you know, some visual diversity to the site and the project. Thank you. Um, and we have, as, as um, Terry reminded me, one of, the, one of the real goals with the planting plan was to be attentive to the views from the various um, abutting properties. And some are more open to the site than others. Um, some are more buffered by some of the vegetation that exists around the periphery of the site. Um, there is minimal lighting on the site. Um, there was a real effort to place clumps of evergreens and varieties of evergreens in specific places around the edge of the property that would help to buffer post lights. Um, you know, again, softening building corners so that it isn't a, a wall of structure. These are single story, they are low buildings, they are pressed into the, to the landscape, but we did make a real effort to, to block the views that, you know, we saw as being objectionable and we, at least we heard, or the team heard through some of the neighborhood meetings that, you know, most of the neighbors were concerned with. So, um, you know, we really did, you know, make an effort to, to focus on some of those, some of those details. Um, you want to talk to the rest of this? I, that's probably all I have plant-wise. I think yeah, there's probably more discussion done. Um, you done? Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's us for now. Okay, great. Um, so any questions or clarifications from the board before we open this up? I just wanted to ask, um, you'd originally talked about one of the versions of the grading of the structures. Is that maintained in the, in the final? Is there the the grading issue, like you, it talk, that was talked about on one of the earlier versions, you said. The five buildings to four buildings? Yeah. Yes, it actually it gets better. Think of them, um, what was that word you used? Benches, they, they kind of, um, because there's a there's spill and uh, in order to accommodate the, the various levels, basically we're creating benches for each of the buildings. Um, the level of, of grade between the buildings is softened because there's only four of them. So it gets better. Yes. Similarly, from the street, down to the bottom of the wall, how far is that? Down ten, ten feet across? About ten feet. Only ten feet. <coughs> yeah, natural grade. Yeah. 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 What's, what's the grade across the side? Oh, you start uh, off. I don't know. Um, okay. yeah. like more than 10 feet when yeah, you're out there on it. That's it is. All. It is. Um, the, the grade from the top to our building, different, different buildings, is um, similar to We go from the front at 230 down to the back at, at the lowest point at 212. Um, the buildings themselves um, start start in uh, 229 and go down to about 217. There's additional slope before and after them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'm reassured by is that I um, I know there are water problems that, that, you know, the stormwater runoff and that the neighborhood has dealt with. So um, for the neighborhood to know, um, we rely on the DPW engineers to review those plans. I think you have to realize that we, we don't have the expertise on the board to review those sort of technical plans. So I'm pleased that that step has followed itself through and the, and the applicant has had to respond to the DPW comments in order to get them to sign off on this project. Um, oftentimes that is a last minute activity because of staffing at the DPW. So in this case, I'd just like to say that some of the, the concerns about stormwater runoff, I think, have been in the consideration of the plans for the DPW. Anybody else have comments? Okay. I'd like to open it up for public comment. So, again, if uh, I do want to hear everyone who's come to speak, you've given us time tonight, but if you're going to echo someone else's comment, I'd love for you to sort of go on the record as doing that and, and <coughs> welcome. Hi, Sarah Northrop, 147 Hinckley Street, um, uh, uh, second to Butter. 
okay. uh, to the north. Um, I have uh, a handful of comments. Uh, I get to go first so other people will be repeating after me instead of uh, me having to worry about repeating myself. Um, my primary concerns um, have been along the lines of lighting shining through the woods. I have seen the, uh, the applicant's chosen light fixture which is, uh, seems to, it's a deep bowl shade that seems to shield lighting pretty well. Um, of course, <coughs> the effect of it um, also has to do with uh, the, what's on the ground. Is it reflecting off of light colored concrete or what? And I know that lighting is a larger concern for folks who will be more directly impacted by it. So I just printed that out. My concern, I would, uh, what I would request is that the, uh, there's going to have to be some condominium documents uh, which normally get filed with the Registry of Deeds. And so future owners, 5, 10, 20 years from now, uh, might say, oh, I like this crystal fixture, which would produce a lot of glare. And um, I know that there's a lot of room in those documents. Sometimes they're ridiculously long. But um, I think there's an opportunity to um, include a requirement that the shade, the, the shaded lighting be uh, maintained. I'm going to pass this on to some of the others who are particularly concerned about that. Um, um, it's a little unclear to me from from the plans the extent of vegetation removal. Um, is it? Uh, it doesn't. There's areas that are marked. I see marked. You know, this area of vegetation to remain. I know there's a bunch of poison ivy there. I wouldn't want the poison ivy to remain, but if you're clearing it out, what are you putting back? Um, and yes, it being um, an underutilized and it's been kind of left to go wild, then the status quo is very woodsy. And in order to make room for the units, they're of course going to have to clear most of that. So there's going to be an impact. Um, uh, I would I would like to see um, it's a it's a, it's a nice planting plan, my compliments, and it looks like it would be fun to create such a planting plan. Um, uh, it isn't clear to me that that is focused on screening uh, to the neighbors, and you'll hear more about their concerns about that. Um, my primary concern uh, is uh, stormwater. Um, uh, looking at the plan, and I reviewed the plan with DPW, I'd, Talk with Dave Valletta, some emails back and forth, um, which may be on the record. Uh, I CC Carolyn on them. Um, I didn't get to talk to Doug McDonald today. He's been pretty busy also. I understand that they integrated some of the comments in their plans, and Terry's an engineer, I'm an engineer. We can speak the same language in that, uh, in that sense. Uh, my experience of the site that I uh, wrote in my email um, to Dave Valletta and Doug McDonald is that um, it, is, it is consistently wet. I know we've had a bit of a drought, and I know Terry was concerned about that, so we had a wetland scientist look at it. He was doing his due diligence. The wetland scientist, I believe, didn't find wetland indicator plants, so he checked soils. Good job he didn't find specific hydric soils that would indicate this is a quote unquote wetland <coughs> um, that would uh, restrict more, but we, what we do have is consistently high groundwater table. Um, so my concern with the design, and this is um, a disagreement with the DPW comments that you have, um, uh, he's got a nice overflow of the rain garden. Rain gardens are great. They can work really well, um, even with minimal maintenance. Um, they'll pro I, I would expect that the condo documents would include an uh, operation and maintenance plan for that. That is something that we've all seen kind of gets forgotten about in 10 years. Oh, were we supposed to mow that or not? Um, it's, it's, it's tricky because it's not just a swale. So maintenance of that should be very clear for folks years from now who don't really know how a rain garden functions. My concern about this design is, um, is the subdrains that I don't, I don't really think they're necessary, and I think they will be continuing to collect the shallow groundwater and then bringing it to daylight. Um, the plans you see 
that I've seen have outlets that are very close to the property line and there's some riprap there to slow it down. Um, my concern that even in a dry season, you, you're kind of defeating the purpose of infiltration and it may depend on the kind of soils they find when they dig down, if they, how well it infiltrates. Uh, if the soil doesn't infiltrate, maybe it needs additional engineering measures, uh, whether it's storm chambers or excavating more to put in sand or more capacity. But what I'm seeing is pipes that discharge at the property line um, on the north property line and the east property line. Um, one would think normally, and maybe on a normal site, they would only be discharging in an overflow event. Um, in this case, given this site, um, I think they will be continually collecting groundwater. Um, so, I, like I said, I didn't get to talk to Doug McDonald about that. Um, it, it might require a test pit on site to, to sort that out. Um, I don't doubt that Terry could figure it out, but I don't think, I, I think it's a big risk here to cause a worse problem on the two adjacent lots that these pipes are directed at. That's my comments. Thank I have here um, comments from um, another neighbor who uh, asked me to bring it and read it into the record. So is this, can you give me the neighbor's name? Uh, Richard Gazowski. Yes, um, I, we have his letter. I would like to summarize it. I, my intention was to not read it verbatim, but to summarize each of his points. Uh, well, is that, um, he had asked me specifically, and uh, I had agreed to, but okay. it's true um, I haven't read it. Have you read it? I, I have read it and underlined the high points, but I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, let's compromise and let the other people that are here on, in person have a comment period, and then we'll see where we are in timing and go one way or the other. Okay, so let me clarify, I'm not specifically in opposition. I understand it's, uh, it's a project that's probably going to happen. Jonathan always tries to do a good job, I've witnessed that. Um, and uh, yeah, I wish it was less units, and I think they'll, uh, they'll address it responsibly. I am really concerned about that uh, water issue for the neighbors and the screening. Thank so you. I will drop it there. Sarah Northrup. Thank you, Ms. Northrup. Uh, next person, welcome. Hi. My name is Joyce Snyder, and I live at 130 Hinckley Street, which is directly across. My driveway is almost across from where they want the entrance to this development to be. And with due respect, I do believe Jonathan Wright does excellent work, but he doesn't live in my house, and none of you do. And basically, the I'm concerned mostly about traffic and water, what they're talking about, I'll get into that a little more, and noise and light, because I don't care how quiet you are. You're talking eight units, 16 minimal people, probably doors opening people, I mean, all that stuff, I accept that, but I wish it were three, and I would ask that it be three. But nonetheless, my driveway, Hinkley Street, and anybody who's here who lives along where I live, in the winter, because of the runoff, the f my, right in front of my driveway becomes solid ice, and it goes pretty much from John, who lives in the Yellow House, to, okay, to, it goes pretty much to about <laughs> where, yes, this is me, and this is you, it goes about to where you're having the driveway. It becomes solid ice. And even with the DPW trying to stay up on top of it, basically we have a one-lane road. And you know, I don't know if everybody lives here, but basically I watch people stop where you're proposing the driveway and they wait while other people go through and that's pretty much every winter and then in the spring or fall or when it rains a lot the same thing happens you at the bottom of my driveway it's a flood and people again it's one way so I don't know how you get seven extra cars to me I mean if you got eight unit eight units you got 16 people and plus they're coming and going and they have friends that's a lot of traffic coming right by my driveway in the morning and in the winter where I basically slide out. It's pretty scary to think there's gonna be all these, and, and by the way, Hinkley is a busy street. People use it as a cut through between Riverside and Nonatuck, so it's not a quiet little street, you know. So I'm very concerned about that. I feel it's danger, I mean, I, the danger of it, and everybody talks about someday we'll redo Hinkley, but we went to meetings two years ago and nothing's been done and they said you know, it could be we didn't 
want a sidewalk, so then they said we, they put us aside. So, you know, what's going to happen over the next couple of years with this? How are you going to address the ice is what I'm concerned mostly and the rainwater? Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, John. Ma'am, uh, ma'am. Excuse me. Uh, Would you like to ask a question? Julie. <coughs> Julie? I can't read my mind. You right. seem very Twice. specific about the number three units. Is there a reason why? Oh, yeah, I wish there were none. I mean, I, you know, he says it's a blight on the neighborhood, but I like, I mean, I see deer, I see bear, I see fox, I have no, I see the stars at night, there's no light. I've been here for 18 years, and I accept that it is going to change, but I'd like it to change as little as possible. Okay. I don't see that there has to be an extra unit. From the back. Yes. Hi, I'm Doug Rosa, and I live at 73 Hinkley, which is far down the street from this particular project, but I do pass by this lot every single day on the way to work. So I feel like I have some something to say about it. Uh, and picking up on Sarah's comment about the drainage, um, have they done any core samples of the soil itself in the immediate area? Because in my backyard, it's nothing but clay. You, you dig down two inches and you're hitting solid clay. I could open a pottery barn in my backyard. <laughs> I got so much clay back there. And clay does not drain. So I don't know if they've done any particular, you know, s investigation of what type of soil is in this immediate lot or if they're just assuming that because there's so much area and the DPW will, has approved the plans, everything's going to be okay. I don't think so. Hakeley Street has a very high water table. As I understand it from an old timer, it used to be a swamp. Okay, so it has a very high water table. It's got a lot of clay soil. The drainage is terrible, okay. As, as you well know, there's always a constant problem down at high school. All the water drains downhill, it comes off Baker Hill, it comes off Maplewood Terrace and through Hinkley, and it just creates some mess over, you know, under heavy uh, precipitation and during the wintertime as well. Um, second off, regards to traffic, um, I keep hearing this, this study was made about, oh, well, it's gonna be minimizing traffic only, you know, so many cars per hour and blah, blah, blah. But I don't know how you can say that because the survey was done. You have to know what the premises were, were for the survey. How many people are going to be living here? Is it going to be a retired couple with one car? Or is it going to be a young family that's got three teenagers, all of which have a car? You could have anywhere from one to five cars per unit. So I can't really honestly believe that this survey is going to accurately reflect the amount of traffic that we could potentially see on the street. Um, and there, uh, finally, there's a, there's a lot of emotion in the neighborhood. Um, uh, the Bay State has a, a blog now, and a lot of people have been emailing back and forth about the situation. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't attend the original meeting that Jonathan uh, when he presented the, the project at the Fikers School. I was out of town then, but I've been keeping up on a lot of people's feelings, and the emotions run high. And, and the very reason is because the very, the very reason that one gentleman pointed out uh, architecture about how this is sort of a bucolic neighborhood, the houses are set back, and lots of big lots and all that. That's what makes Hinkley Street Hinkley Street. There's a lot of trees on Hinkley Street. It's a very quiet street. It's a very cool street. If you drive past the high school on a hot summer day and it's 95 degrees, as soon as you get down onto Riverside Drive on the Hinkley, it's cooled off immediately five or 10 degrees because there's so many trees there. So I don't want to see that being compromised because of this extra development. And for me, what, I, what I'm seeing here is almost a, a, a foot in the door to more development on my street, okay? Uh, if the city approves this as it sits, four units on a, on a little over an acre of a lot, um, who else on the street may say, hey, this is a pretty good deal. I'm able to take my house, tear it down like they did, okay, and put up more more condos or more, or more duplexes. So what I see here is sort of almost, almost a wedge in the door to put uh, further development on Hinkley Street, which again is going to destroy the whole character of the neighborhood. Now again, uh, you know, progress is progress. I understand that. But, um, you know, we're, we're, the, the presentation that we got tonight was led us to believe that, oh, they're doing a wonderful thing. We tore down this old decrepit house. It wasn't worth anything. And uh, geez, because we're so clever, we got these four units here. We could have had, you know, five on the street or a big, you know, uh, or 20, 20 units, all the same. But oh, boy, we're selling for four. But to my point of view, why four? Why not, why not one? Why not two? In other words, why not maintain the character of the street rather than shoehorning these four, these eight, well, eight units really into this, this particular development? And then, like I say, perhaps creating the conditions where other people who, who retire and they sell their house could be bought up by other developers, Thank more you. units going in. And suddenly Hinkley Street, which is, as was pointed out, is already heavily trafficked, believe it or not. And it's going to be more so when it's finally rebuilt, which again may happen perhaps. I don't know the city's been talking about that. I've been there for 20 years and the city's been talking about it for 20 years. Any point is, 
it's this kind of it's, this could be the thing that snowballs into a bigger situation on the street, which again destroys the semi-rural character of Hinkley Street. Thank you. You're welcome. Next. Hello, Jonathan Little, Linda 36 Hinkley Street, and I'd like to kind of uh, comment further on the gentleman in front of me. I think the surprising thing about this project is what I would consider a kind of a glaring hole in uh, the zoning, which uh, from my understanding is to try to protect the character of a neighborhood. And uh, thank goodness that Mr. Wright has decided not to proceed with some of the other, uh, the other uh, layouts, but just the fact that uh, a neighborhood with predominantly single structures per parcel could accommodate 5, 10, 20 units uh, seems to be just in true conflict with the neighbor, uh, character of the neighborhood. And uh, I think the zoning, I know all, all of you didn't write the zoning or draft the zoning, but it just seems wild to me that um, there would be that kind of leeway uh, to allow that kind of density into a neighborhood that's pretty well established. It's been there for a really long time. Uh, again, not against uh, you know development you know, together, but I think that the right kind of sense of development is something that everyone should be concerned about through all the neighborhoods in the city. And I, I would uh, hope that uh, there might be some consideration to really kind of fine tune some of the uh, zoning for neighborhood if necessary, uh, like in other municipalities, to not allow uh, that kind of density to go into a predominantly neighborhood of uh, single structure parcels. Thank you. Thank you. Another? Yes. I wasn't going to get up and say anything, but I am going to say so something. Please say your My name, name is Lonnie Patnoad, and I live at 111 Hinckley Street. And I'm right on the side of where they're going to build their, about my driveway. Um, I'm not opposed to anybody building there. I am opposed to the traffic because we do, and people don't think we do, but people speed down there and go really fast. And <coughs> people who walk in the neighborhood, it's lovely because you can walk in the neighborhood. And people walk with their dogs and their kids, and there's kids on bicycles. And I'm just really concerned about the amount of people that will be living there because um, of and it's four units and he's done a wonderful job I mean it's it's really beautiful what it's going to be but it's a little close to me <laughs> so I'm a little concerned about the traffic issue and yes Hinkley Street they promised some time ago that they're going to do Hinkley Street and they haven't done it yet and we've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting um, I think the idea is good. I am concerned about the traffic going in and out of there. And if it's going to be people with a whole bunch of little kids or something, I mean, I have 12 grandchildren, so little kids don't bother me, per se. But if they're going to be wandering no, over into my no yard, <laughs> you know, and uh, trying to climb trees and do different things like that, yes, I'm going to be very concerned because that's a dangerous thing. But I j and the lighting, I would like the lighting to be minimal because sometimes at, at, at night, you know, cars go by and the lights flash in your window. It doesn't matter if you have blinds or drapes or what you have, it still, sh it still shines in. And um, I thought it was only going to be two bedroom. It's going to be two or three? One of them is two, the other is three. Oh, I didn't understand that. Okay. And I think, you know, that was it supposed to be for people of, of a certain age and above? No. Which you were kind of trying to get to? Mixed age. The target market is, is up to 30, 40 up. Yeah, see, and that invites people with young children and teenagers who are, and I had teenagers, I have four of them, so I know. Um, they go in and out with cars and they make noise and they have people over and they make lots of noise outside and things like that. And it's, it is a quiet neighborhood and I like it because it's that way. So um, I'm not disputing what you're trying to build there at all. And you know that Terry because we've talked about it many times. Um, but the noise level would annoy me. And I'll sell you my house now for a million dollars. No. <laughs> can, can I ask the other speakers to speak to the board so we can keep this from getting away from us? Um, another comment or yes? 
<laughs> Hi there, your name? Hi, I'm Laura Reinhardt. I live at 22 Nottatuck Street. And um, I have bought this property, 121 Hinkley, on my southern border um, for the full 263 feet. Can't hear me. Wow, <laughs> I feel like I'm shy. I'm very nervous. This is very hard for me. Um, all right, so my uh, I'm an abutter of 121 Hinkley on the um, its northern border, and um, if you were to stand at my kitchen window or my bedroom window or on my porch, um, you would understand why this is not a preferred occurrence here. I would prefer to have what I have, which is green, but I'm. You know, I understand. I appreciate Jonathan's work, um, but I also want to appreciate why I bought my home um, in 2004. It was $255,000, which is about $100,000 less than these homes will be, and the same square f feet. It's 1,200 square feet, um, but I'm on an acre of land. Um, I bought this because the zoning would protect the surrounding properties from being built on. And I'm a sculptor and a landscaper, and this was to be my gallery. And this kind of change where I'll have all these buildings on my, as my southern view um, is really disturbing for me. Um, I understand the concept of infill. Um, I believe in it, but I believe tonight that you're setting a precedent, and I just want to understand, you know, do you understand that you're defining infill and building density, and today are you going to say that eight homes can replace one? My concerns is that once you do this that there's no turning back that you're setting up our neighborhood for a land grab where wealthy builders and investors can buy homes, raise them to the ground, and put up condo complexes. You're very quickly going to edge out people like myself and my neighbors, the artists and the nurses and the school teachers, because we won't be able to afford these homes that you're putting up, and we will not be able to compete. I think this is working against the entire concept of environmental equity, which is a part of what infill is supposed to preserve. The number three rated favorite green space in Northampton are people's backyards. These homes actually don't have backyards, but we do, and that's what we'd like to maintain. With the increase in density, uh, you're destroying really crucial, healthy byways for the wildlife in this area. Everyone in our neighborhood can tell you that animals travel between the Mill River and the wetlands at Smith <coughs> Vocational School. These are the byways, and we have healthy animal populations, diverse animal populations. By increasing the density of buildings, and it's going to require removing trees, existing trees, and it's going to destroy these byways. And that goes against the concept of protecting wildlife corridors, which is a part of what this infill was actually supposed to protect on a bigger scale. Um, the rain garden issue has already been addressed, but it actually affects my property deeply because I am downhill. Um, this land, 121 Hinkley, slopes north and east, and I am north of this property. Um, it is pointed out that my land is already wet. Um, the discharge, the outlet pipe on the north border um, discharges onto my property. And that area right now in the midst of a drought is lush with ferns and mo moss. This is not land that requires more water. So I'm very concerned about what's going to happen if these plans on paper don't work in reality. 
and my property, the water table in my property go, gets higher or my basement starts to flood um, or there is a mold issue, um, what recourse do I have to mitigate these issues if these plans don't actually work as they are supposed to? Um, I am in, uh, very concerned about the lights, the car lights for the 16 cars, the house lights, security lights. There are 25 lights out right now um, on the outsides of the homes, and um, I'm sure the insurance companies are going to require security lighting for a condo unit because of recent suits in our area with condo associations with people getting injured when it wasn't properly lit. That's going to change the night sky in our area. Um, it's going to stress the wildlife that depends on darkness to safely pass. Um, and it's annoying, quite honestly. Um, I asked Jonathan in person and in two emails uh, for one thing, because I understood that this was probably going to happen, whether I wanted it or not. It was going to happen in a density probably higher than I wanted. But I asked him for a row of Arborvitae nigra um, through the middle section on the north border to shield me from those lights, the cars, uh, lights, the window lights, the security lights. And um, he told me that arborvitae hedges were not in keeping with the nature of the neighborhood. <laughs> I have the email here if you'd like. I have four arborvitae hedges on my property. <laughs> and I walked around the neighborhood and I quickly counted 12 others. So I reminded him of that and that I reminded him that actually they are in keeping with the nature of the neighborhood and what he is proposing is not in keeping with the nature of the neighborhood. <sighs> he tried to placate me by including a few other arborvitaes on the existing plan. These were arborvitae emerald green, not arborvitae nigra that I asked for. There is actually a difference in arborvitaes. I can spell it out for you, but I won't. You can Google it. Um, they grow to different heights, different widths. They have served different purposes. What I asked for, have, mine have grown to almost 20 feet tall in 10 years. They perfectly screen homes. They provide homes, shelters for birds, shelter from the north wind, which is in keeping with the concept of net zero housing. Um, I felt that he tried to placate me, but I, what I really felt was that I was being ignored and that my needs were not heard. I want my privacy. I want what I bought. I want my green vista. It is not too much to ask to have that back. I am on the north side. I can't plant without tearing down more trees, which would ruin all the issues around the water on my property already. There is so much. I'm going to finish here so others can speak. Um, I looked at the landscaping plans that were up. It doesn't take long. It took me about a minute and a half to see that these can't possibly be finished plans. So I think that there's room to change them. Um, if you look quickly, there are 10 trees uh, that are slated to be over 40 feet tall on the south side of buildings, which are meant to be solar including a meta sequoia, which is a dawn redwood. They grow to 90 feet tall. So if these are finished plans, who has really addressed the solar issue? The spruce trees on the north side will grow at least 20 feet wide in a 15 foot setback. Um, so I bring this up because it's how something may look good on paper, but doesn't work well in practice. And I just feel that since I brought up something that was a really reasonable, very reasonable solution, it's all I asked from him, and I was refused, I felt that it just doesn't matter. The neighbors are not being listened to, and this is going to go up. The buzz in town is that it's slated to break ground in October, and all of us feel like we're just being bulldozed. Uh, the traffic issue has been addressed. Um, but the one thing that hasn't been pointed out is that there is parking for 16 
Um, we can assume that probably eight residences will use those 16 parking spaces, so I want to ask where the, res where the guests will park. If it's on Hinckley Street, where there will be a sidewalk, will they be pulling off the road onto the sidewalk to park illegally? Uh, will they be parking at the where Mount Warner has a very awkward, obtuse intersection there? I'm just not sure. I think it's reducing Hinckley to a one-lane street more than it already is. So in short, there are just too many houses. I would agree to three units or six residences. I think four units, eight residences is too much. If you, if you decrease by one unit, you will decrease the impact on the permeability of the land, decrease the runoff, decrease the need for the number of water gardens, have sufficient parking, decrease the light pollution, decrease the noise pollution, decrease the traffic issues, um, and make it more like the village neighborhood that Jonathan is trying to sell this as and less of a condo complex. Um, I urge you tonight to consider um, what I and many others have said and will say. Now, this is our neighborhood, and you have a big responsibility tonight because you're setting a precedent and we don't want the precedent of a land grab. Thank you. My name is Jana Shiaka. I live at 136 Hinckley Street. I'd be kitty corner to this project. I don't have anything much new to say. Um, I'm very concerned about the parking. I don't think mid-century modern, the way it looks on these diagrams, is in keeping with the neighborhood. I'm concerned about the sewer. Um, when you say that there's a day's storage if the electricity goes out, I'm confused about that. I don't understand. We lose electricity for 10 days at a time. I would like to see the project scaled down. Good evening, I'm Matthew Jarrett at 14 Nonthorpe Street. I'm going to piggyback on many people's comments, uh, so I'll try to make them brief as, as possible. Uh, the last gentleman's presentation said that they made an effort to focus on strategic planning of landscaping to cut down on building corners and lighting. However, there appears to be no landscaping on the corner of the lot facing my home. The back of the upper right building on the second lot, uh, as it's appeared in the map over there, or as it appears in the map up on the screen, I second Sarah Northrop's point on the deep bowl lighting requirement uh, for the condo association, but what else are they doing about the landscaping on the back corner directly facing my property? Also, I second Sarah Northrop's comment on the analysis of the rain garden overflow drains. I haven't seen the report from the DPW. I wasn't aware it was available, but I'm wondering if any analysis, been, analysis has been done on the height of the water table and compared that to the depth of that overflow valve um, um, to the surface flow. Two of those overflow drains are pointed directly at, um, at my property. And according to the map that I have available to me, the elevation of my property is 10 feet below the location of those rain gardens. <coughs> Adding to Doug Rosa's comment uh, that he has clay in his yard, I know that's uh, also true on, on my, on, in my backyard. Not, granted, not nearly as, as he described <laughs> in my property, but uh, I have dug up clay in my own yard. Uh, Laura Reinhardt's comment, I second her comments on the protection of wildlife corridors. The Northampton Police Department once told me that the four bears in the, on the back deck in my, uh, in my home uh, were, quote, part of the neighborhood, end quote. Uh, my dark nights are going to be affected and the countless fireflies in my backyard, which are beautiful, the deer and bears that roam through may disappear. I also second her comment on the water level. My property, which is per per perpendicularly oriented from Laura's, so accumulatedly accounting for 50% of the border of this property, is also lush with many ferns during the drought we're experiencing. So I appreciate you listening to all of our comments and uh, taking them into consideration. Thank you. Someone else? Hi, my name is Jean Almanzar, and I just wanted to um, sort of piggyback on the comments that were already made. I won't say through all of them again, but I just want to point out, I live at the other end of Hinkley Street. Uh, we live at number 16. Um, but it is, um, I would 
the the thing that makes me think about um, or the thing that makes me most concerned is the precedent being set of we we have a, a beautiful neighborhood with houses set back as was pointed out on really nice sized lots it's quiet it's very country for being so close to downtown Northampton and being so close to downtown Florence and I, I would really hate to see that change as each new property comes up I would really hate to see one house replaced by four or eight or um, however many so that that's a real concern that I have and I would also like to just echo at our end of the street which I um, we live right by a, a three unit uh, house which is sort of big for for our end of the street and um, when there's company over it's tricky for us to get out of our driveway especially in the winter um, and I can only imagine eight units where those cars where visitors cars would be on the street in the bad weather uh, I don't think there's any plan to widen Hinkley Street if it ever gets done uh, I think it's going to be the same width so that to me is a concern um, just in in sort of general terms but my, my biggest um, concern is the the replacing one house one single family house with four two family units thank you Hi, Debbie Meyer, 26 Hinkley Street. Uh, I made some notes to try to go quickly. Um, kind of new to the area, so I just want to ask, the code is for three units, three single family houses, is that right? The code for Hinkley Street in Florence? The zoning. Um, the zoning is urban residential B. It allows a, a, a range of different type of unit configurations. So but three up units? To, up to three units in a single structure. If you could tap the computer for a second, that would be great. I don't want to lose that image. Oops. Um, so, um, but with a, um, um, that's without a special permit. So the application here is a special permit for more that if you do um, um, structures on commonly owned land, um, you can apply for a permit to have more than three units per parcel. So the three units is one family each? Just so um, a three unit structure would contain what we would, you know, by definition would be considered a three family. A triplet. Right. So three families on this piece of land. Well, there are four structures proposed, right. with two units in each. Right. So um, they would, um, you know, they're smaller units, 1,200 square foot units. Um, so there are um, two households could occupy each structure. Okay, so code is for six, is that correct? I'm just she trying to. Know. Oh, she wants to know what can be done by right. I'm right, without a special permit, is it three families, Sorry. three houses? What they showed previously was dividing <coughs> the parcel up into four separate lots without having to come for um, uh, any permitting. So you okay, could so come four in and houses. Do four structures, but have either a single family with an accessory unit or two families. So then you'd have essentially eight units without coming to the planning board. But the okay. configuration they've selected. Um, necessarily triggers review by the planning board. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Okay, the thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to be clear because people are coming up here saying they know this is going to happen, but it's the job of um, of everybody who's voting that code is followed, and very rarely are exceptions made. So, uh, excuse me for reading off the paper. I'm trying to be quick to get everybody home tonight and allow everybody to speak properly. Um, so again, three units, four units, and then you ask for eight units. Um, it's like having a misbehaved child. They're really bad, they're really bad. Okay, they're not so bad now, so give them this toy. It doesn't, I don't understand that kind of thinking, and it opens up that child or that builder from doing it over again and actually being worse next time. Um, the yard runoff, I was um, able to be um, involved in talks in a neighborhood in Florida um, where drainage is an issue. Uh, if you take water and you spill it on this desk, 
it's going to puddle right there. It's not going to drain in. Clay soils, of course, have limited drainage, but they have a drainage. If you are on a desk or a house or a roof or a pavement or garages or walkways, there is no drainage. You are funneling it, but it's not going into the ground. It's going somewhere, and from what I've heard, it's going into other people's yards, which does not seem right to me. Um, number three, the plan doesn't fit the neighborhood. That's obvious. Um, okay, analogy of the word trace. Um, trace to a corridor for animals. It looks like this is counterintuitive of that and will prevent the animals. Um, the animals are going to be scared. They're not going to go there. Um, and that's why a lot of people live in this area. Um, OK, um, two to three bedrooms. So you're figuring two to three bedrooms, that's two adults minimum. That's 16 cars. Everybody's talking about 16 cars. That's minimum. The kids are 16. Now they have a car. Now they have friends. What about Thanksgiving? What about Sunday dinner? Um, I live kind of close to that three unit house condo. And yes, there are times that I have to wait at the end of the street because there's a line of cars parked and two people can't fit down the road at the same time. Um, okay, he's trying to move along as quickly as possible for you. Um, I am very new to Bay State. I moved there six months ago. I specifically picked this neighborhood for all of the reasons these people have laid out. It's family oriented. You can walk. It's safe. It's quiet. I sit in my backyard and look at stars. It's the quality of life. I didn't look in other areas. I, I saw Bay State. Houses don't go up for sale often in Bay State. I know that because I was watching for that neighborhood for a long time and finally got the house. And now I'm seeing, OK, hopefully uh, people will stand up and do it their job and do what's right and I'm glad to see the neighborhood has pulled together and is really taking a stand. Um, my last point I think is um, when I'm looking at a problem uh, in my job, I'm a problem solver, but when I look at a problem and I'm trying to figure out two sides, I look at the other side and I say, who does this benefit? This does not benefit the neighborhood. There's not a real I, I mean, this housing is not $200,000 housing where low-income people can live there. This is, does not fit in this neighborhood, and it does not benefit the neighborhood. It's going to overall have a negative impact on the whole Bay State area, and from what I can see, it's going to benefit um, some businesses. Um, so let me see if that is it. I can take questions if anybody has questions. Um, uh, I especially feel bad for the people that are immediately bordering. Light is definitely going to be a problem. Cars are definitely going to be a problem. Um, snow, ice, and water is definitely going to be a problem. You can say we're going to re-divert things and have everything go a certain way. Mother Nature usually has the final say, as we can see with the weather patterns that have developed. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? No, thank you, Ms. I Martin. appreciate your attention. Thank mm -hmm. you. So I have a couple of letters here of people that I wanted to go over. Are there any other comments from the from the public? Yes. Which is the one entrance into the complex? If we have heavy. I'm snow. sorry. Can I get your name? Oh, and my name is Doug Garten at 136 Hinkley Street. Thank you. It's you know we we raised this question when it was a five unit. Um, plan, but I still don't see how if we have heavy snow with one entrance with cars all locked in there, is it going to cause a, a, an incident with snow removal Thank you. and safety? So we received a letter from Mark Jarvis um, expressing concern about the project. Um, he is uh, concerned that the planning board has already decided to grant the special permit for the project in question. Um, and he recounts an exchange that he had after our last meeting that made him think that. Um, uh, speaking for the planning board, I, 
these are very difficult projects for us to go through. I don't think we ever decide them ahead of time. What we do look to do is try to balance the intention of getting growth in our town to happen in places where it should instead of further out in far suburbs that tax our ability to support them. And then I think we also look for, for responding to concerns. I mean, this is, uh, frankly, a very difficult position to be in. I, I, you know, it's not a fun night for any of us. So um, I, don't, I, I, I don't really agree with his letter that we made up our minds ahead of time. I, I find it very painful to make decisions on people's property. I understand. Um, the other letter that we got was the one that was mentioned earlier um, by Laura. Um, I'm sorry, I missed your last name. Uh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah, I'm sorry. Um, it's a, a letter uh, to express opposition to the proposal, um, and it holds six major points. The first is that the development will max out the new infill ordinance, and it's totally out of character with the dwellings. The second concerns uh, stormwater runoff of the existing property onto a, uh, adjacent neighbor's property. The third is uh, the design is inadequate for uh, practical snow plowing and snow storage. Uh, the fourth is uh, parking for guest tenants. The fifth is uh, open space um, um, with much of the site covered with uh, garages and dwelling units and patios and porticos and walkways. And the sixth is a concern for the sanitary waste pumped uphill to a street drain. Uh, with that little pause, is there anything else that public wants to say before we close the public comment period and then we start the deliberation? Uh, I guess it's, I'd like to say one thing. I, was, I mean, this whole pumping waste upstream, <coughs> what happens if the, we might recall I had a snowstorm in last uh, Halloween several years ago, power out for a week. Yeah. Yeah. Is there backup facilities for pumping waste out of this, out of this development for up to a week of time? Okay, thank you. Ah, uh, okay. Um, Carolyn's giving me advice to possibly keep this open because that way we've got the ability to ask questions that could get answered by the applicant. So um, I'll do that and wait to close it. Discussions? Um, yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions for the developer. Uh, one is <clears throat> there, there several people have made mention about um, water discharge onto adjacent properties. I'd like that clarified. I assume that is not the case, but I'd like to know for sure. And the second is, um, as was mentioned, the northwest, the northeast corner is the only area that has no trees planned. I wondered why that is and if that could be changed. I can talk to the stormwater. Uh, it's true the soils in this area are very poor soils. They're all C and D soils. Um, they're not good for infiltrating. Um, there is no intention of infiltrating on these. However, they will seasonally infiltrate. We take no credit for it. Um, this system is designed to basically discharge as it normally, as events normally would occur. Um, the stormwater management on this is it's being detained and slowed down through these rain gardens. Um, the discharge is less than what happens as it sits now. So uh, the, the perception is sure you, you have these discharge points, but the, the fact is when you do the numbers, it, it's actually less runoff. We did do test pits out there. I know what the soils are. We dug deep holes. We know what it is. The right-hand corner, the northeast corner on this plan, is all sand, 10 feet down of sand. Yet you go 40 feet to the west, and you're back into silts. And uh, you know, theoretically, there's no clay in the state, but clay soils. Um, so you know, it, it's, it, it was not designed with any intention of, of claiming infiltration just because the soils are, are very poor. Um, the rain garden construction is 
very robust. You may want to review that for the board. But this is a uh, not just a detention basin. Right. I mean, it's four or five feet of material. The the point in these rain gardens is is that you're you you're really providing a, a higher level of water quality than you normally would get with typical runoff because you're running it through a media filter basically, and and in doing so. There is some detention in the rain garden for large events. It'll pool in the rain garden, but otherwise it is going down through a media for most events. And, and then it has a, a subdrain underneath that also acts as an additional reservoir. And that, that's how the, the stormwater is managed. So explain to me the drains that go out to the edge of the pond. So these, these are designed to drain during rain events. Um, and any rain event you're going to have on this site is going to have runoff going off to a budding property. That's the requirement, is you do not increase the runoff going to other properties. We decrease the runoff going to other properties on this site with this design. Have you concentrated it, though? No. No, we've, we've incorporated level spreader to disperse it on, on those discharge locations. Um, so. That was one of the uh, discussions with the uh, BPW was what that throat should look like. And yeah, so there's a level spreader here at this discharge. So it, it comes out, it comes out into a stone pickup area, and then it's spread across this area. And then same thing with this one. And you have to recognize also the, the benefit that's happening here. And so Laura's house is up here. She has a drain right there that is part of this cross-country so storm sewer, okay? So there's a drain there, there's a drain there, and there's a drain here. And what's currently happening is there's a drainage area that kind of runs like this across the site, and this whole area in here runs all the way all over here. And that's, that's part of the reason this is all wet. This is also the lowest area, so that's where all the water collects. Whether it be running off or seeping out in the spring, that's where your water collects and it runs down through here, and that's why these drains were put in here originally. That's why the city originally put all this in here, was to dry it out. So the, the intent with this system is not only, you know, it may seem like we're directing it towards this, but there's flooding that comes from all the water that's remaining that runs down into this area and it's flooding these yards running between the properties down below to the east here and actually washing if they've, they've dug ditches and it's actually filling the storm sewer with sediment down on federal street because of the situation that's going on here this will help that okay. you're just going to redirect it onto my property you just said there's flooding below this property you're going to instead put it up there no no, what, what, first of all, we're reducing the amount that's actually going towards your property. I'd love to hear how you reduce the amount of water that's coming towards the property. Wait, can it's, it's, it's detention. It's, 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 it's controlling how fast water comes off and, and, and then dispersing it. That's the whole intent. That's how, that's how any stormwater system is designed. And so we take into account. In addition, you know, these, these things, because I don't take any advantage of, of infiltration, this time of year, December, um, when it's dry, all this water is going into the ground. It's not going to come out. It's going to infiltrate. So I realize you had to convince the DPW of the clear fact that you were reducing the water runoff. Right. So it's not a matter of having to say there is no runoff. You, you cannot fix that runoff because yeah, it of is, the it property is. itself. But I would like for you to speak to the street water and how that is happening around that property. Uh, what do you mean the street water? The water that gets funneled by the street. By the development, the driveway? Right. That's all collected into the rain gardens. All, all the water coming off the driveways, the majority of the roofs, are all directed into So that. you're managing any of your impervious space that you're exactly. creating. And that, that's what's required in, in the stormwater regulation, is that not only do you, you collect all of that and treat it, you know, that you also make sure that you do not increase the discharge that's going off of the site, too. 
but how, I'm wondering how much of the neighborhood's water problem is being caused by street water getting down the street system and gathering and then going to where the lowest points are in the neighborhood. Are you saying how much water is coming onto the property from the street? No, no, just the experience of the neighbors having water problems in that area. I'm wondering if, and I don't know that it, I'd, I'd like to be asking the DPW, if the nature of the drainage of the streets, you know, we're talking about the slanting of, of you know, the, str the streets actually carry water. Right. You know, I, was, I think you mentioned at the beginning that there was some issue about drainage in the street that's causing some of this off-site flow. Well, yeah, well, there's a couple things. Right now, you know, the, the street actually, when, this, when, the, when, the, when these drains here and here, and then, um, then down here, there's two, two over there. Um, when those fail and they get clogged with leaves and so on, what happens is the water goes down the road and it either goes currently right across the property here, you get all the street runoff coming right across and going down onto Laura's property, or when this one fails, all this comes down here and it just washes straight through here. Okay, and that, that's, a, that's a big thing. I've watched it this last winter, flooding regularly because the leaves get in there and it's not being cleaned and, and they can't handle it. So. You know, and, and hopefully that'll get addressed a little bit with some of the reconstruction, but it's still likely to happen. Um, just because DPW can't be out there cleaning the grates all the time. So uh, our, our driveway grades provide some protection against intake of that. Oh yeah, well with, with the design here, there's this, this is designed to hump and prevent that water from coming down the driveway anymore. So that won't be happening. And for the driveway water to go out onto the street is prevented. This, right. This driveway, yeah, yeah that's all of yep. the, uh, um, yeah. Alan also asked you a question about the uh, uh, planting to the, to the northeast corner. So up here is where we're talking about. Jeff, Jeff can talk a little yeah, bit. Yeah, remind me what our thinking was about that corner. It does look a little bald. There. It was, well, it was really about the existing vegetation and, okay. you know, the fact that it's it's fairly dense in that portion of the property or off, you know, off the property with, limits. With so what? With the existing vegetation. The, the, the woods beyond that are. are That's what I'm asking. Dense. Is it woods? It's yes. all woods, yeah. They're not shown on the plan, though? They're uh, not on the property. Not on this plan. They what about on your, oh, oh you mean your, yeah. Your answer referred to vegetation on a budding property? On, on existing property, right. I mean, if you look at aerial yeah. image, it's, it's well wooded. This is know. kind of the tree line right here, the existing. Oh, let me go back a couple more. Um, so this is the tree line as it sits right now, right in here. And so this is all trees through here. Matter of fact, this is a little bit, this is a problem in this drain the city's having that big locusts are growing into this drain. Uh, but it, it's all wooded throughout there. Yes, sir. Uh, it might not be as thickly wooded as would otherwise assume or would otherwise be presented here because I regularly see headlights coming down uh, Maplewood uh, from, from my back kitchen window. Okay. Well, just for, you know, just to, to address this general uh, question about light, um, and privacy. Um, what I had said uh, in a conversation with Laura is that I don't want to create the feeling of a walled compound. And um, and but and it, but after our conversation, we added more um, evergreens. Uh, we can revisit that. I just I want to be careful that it, it doesn't look forced. That it has a natural character to it. It's not about. I just don't want to plant a row. We just had a discussion here earlier this evening about a fence versus a wall of green. And we're not trying to do that. Um, this is visible through there now. There's light, si uh, there are sight lines through this project in all directions. It's not a wall of building. Um, but as far as this gentleman's concerned, I have no objection to a, a, a condition to uh, propose in whatever way is appropriate some additional planting there, and as Laura as, as well. I mean, I don't, it isn't the money thing, it's that we don't want to cut the existing tree root system to plant new, new plantings, and we, we are. Uh, planning to build at the 15-foot setback line. So uh, we want to protect the trees that are there that are with the property and also the, the abutters trees. So, so that's how we came to our planting plan. Um, 
you know, if there's a feeling that we should do something more with that at a lower elevation, <coughs> feel like it's not a problem. I'm happy to do that. It might be helpful to show the line of um, car entrance to um, the, the, the uh, access points and what's beyond them. So it looks like the driveway, you know, cars were entering the site. In the driveway, there are buildings sort of surrounding that that act as a screen potentially, um, including well, garage units. Yeah, so I you mean, might want to just, I don't know if you This building here that. actually will act as, as a screen from headlights to some degree um, of shining through the woods, definitely. And um, is there a also, this building there? here is going to provide actually a complete screen of any headlights coming down Maplewood Terrace. Right. You're not going to see any lights that once that building's in. Yes. Evergreens. Thank you. Plants. Yes. Um, Alan, did you get your question answered? I, I guess so. I mean, my understanding, uh, so you've said you don't need trees in that corner because well, there's the so reason, many yeah, trees. The on reason there isn't drop. anything proposed is because it's already densely wooded. And yes, <laughs> they're, they're large trees, so you probably do see the tree lights through them. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, you're not the, going to see those headlights because there's a building now in that corner, but it, well, it doesn't, it, it just, it, you're not going to see headlights from these buyers there. Um, not just headlights, though, of course, it's right. Other, 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 building other building lights. But and this is going to be the garage the, half the distance that maybe would tear to be. We do need to understand that this is dark skies. There is no foot candles at the property line. These are hooded lights. They're completely contained. One of the hardest things we have in this industry is that the only way we can get the foot candle analysis done is through the commercial lighting wholesalers who want, for insurance reasons, to provide too much light. The lights that will actually go in here will be fewer in wattage than what's on the plan because that's what we do. We like to have a residential level of lighting that's just barely adequate. And well, the lighting there. Uh, I, I know you know what we've been going through trying to replace city street lights with LEDs and the discussion there. And some of my favorite lights on Smith campus are the very lights you're talking about. They've done a good job in selecting them. We're not planning any, uh, you know, double head flood fixtures blasting out. Uh, in, in no way will that happen or occur. It just won't. There are back doors on, facing the north, but, and there are no patios there. We do, by code, have to have a light by that door, and it will be another one of the crook, uh, bishops, what's called Bishop's Crook. Uh, and again, it, it has a cast about a 15-foot circle. You have to have it. And, you know, and, and I think you're willing to adjust planting to provide more screening on those. And That's, you know. I, I don't want to put plantings in uh, to the point where, as they mature, to Laura's point, they become unruly and have to be taken out. So. I know the public wants to speak, and you've already had at least one shot at it, so I'm interested in getting the board's sure. comments. I'm not closed to the public comment period yet, but bear with me. Um, Ann? I would like to know what the plan is for snow and whether or not there could be parking for guests in this, or whether you had to dismiss that idea altogether. The, the, um, we were asked by the city to reduce, to have a lower number of parking places than we're showing. Mm -hmm. the, the plan is for there to be guest parking on the street, and that's considered traffic. Yeah. 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 I, 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 that is what I've been told, and you see it on Massasoit Street now. So, but our proposal is to provide more parking than is required or recommended by the city for the very reason that um, people need a place you have visitors overnight in the winter, they can't park on the street. Well, and I would, I, I know that street is not used to this, but I know 
closing my eyes that my neighborhood has many a street that's only one car passage when we deal with it. It has the advantage actually of show, slowing down traffic. That's, that's, yeah, that's the official. one thing it does. But um, um, and I don't think that's a permanent assignment there with the, the uh, parking on site. Where I'm is the snow? Where, where is the solid ice in the winter? Yes. <laughs> where is the snow? So snow removal. Exactly. There's not a lot of opportunity, but generally the, the only real good areas for snow removal are off of here and, and in here. And then if it, if it gets too much, it's going to have to be hauled out. Right. Uh, that's, that's what it is. Could you foresee it going on patios or the two? No. Okay. No. So the walkways and patios are kept. So the free. condo area will have to get together and haul yeah, it Yeah, that'll that's be right. part of the document. It'll be and maintenance managed. agreement. And you know, you, you, there was a question raised earlier about what happens in the out years, and any suggestions that can be brought forward for how to prevent um, later intrusions on the site plan um, is really what, you know, very welcome because yep. I don't want to see it changed either. Okay, any other board comments? Just to kind of reiterate and for me to make sure that we all kind of understand this, that this one parcel has 200 feet of frontage, so it could very easily be subdivided into four separate parcels with four buildings and eight units. So that's... And I can think of several places around town where the houses have been placed on the 15-foot wide lot. So this is a very large parcel as it stands, but absolutely do doesn't need to remain one parcel, and we wouldn't have any idea until we go to the future. So that kind of helps me understand what that could potentially look like versus what this plan is proposing, which is certainly much more compatible than, you know, four narrow, skinny, 50-foot lots with duplexes on them. Which would be permissible under the current right. 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 And if that were the design, it wouldn't be before us. It would it would it would be before the building inspector and the planning office and if it met the rules it would be possible um, um, I, I, I wanted to speak a little to the traffic plan because you were raising this how could we do the counts um, I just wanted to assure you there's a a manual of traffic engineers that ha lays out exactly how you have to do a traffic analysis and that's where the number of seven extra a day comes from it's a it's a it's a standard uh, handbook for for developing those plans S um, I, I have some confidence in in those I know seven extra a day sounds like a lot but uh, King Street carries roughly 2400 cars a day so, I mean, I, I know that's not your 24,000, thank you. Um, I, I don't have a good comparable metric for, an, for a neighborhood street, but um, it, it's that, that amount of additional traffic is a minor, is a, is a minor outcome from, from a property change, really. Um, Diane. Yeah, I'm, I think this is just a, a a really bad example of infill. I mean, I, I think infill has, has a place and it's not here. And I, it's, it, um, I think the zoning doesn't account for situations like this. This is really out of place so for the neighborhood. Maybe for the benefit of the public. Sure, I, um, I, underst I understand. I like the fact that. that it's scaled down. It's not big, massive buildings, it's lower buildings. I like the green building, the HERS rating, the, you know, the things that we're after to try to make our utilities last into the future are here. Right. And, it's, and it is all of those things, but it's not in keeping with the neighborhood. It's four, essentially, two, 3,000 square foot buildings. They're large, they're flat, but they're large. Um, and it displaces a lot of a lot of green space, 
and that neighborhood is absolutely um, well proportioned and this room this will stand out in the neighborhood as being an unproportionate uh, development and you know well, I'm sensitive I, to the foot in the door comment that that you know that is a recognition that other properties along there can do that but I also you know it, it pains me to see subdivision development out on 66 you know that's just not how our town can exist into the future um, you know we're we're experiencing uh, you know utility extra charges now just to bring our water pipe system up to speed and I I'm, I'm torn I I, under, I understand neighbor problems I I've worked hard to be a good neighbor I think these people have too they like each other um, but I don't think this development is as uh, egregious as it could have been there's no doubt but that's no reason to, to go f to agree with it it's the lesser of two evils, perhaps. I don't think anybody would propose a four-strip um, subdivision here, as would be by right. Maybe they would, but I don't think that would be nearly as sellable as this. And I feel, you know, and I might be in the, in the minority here, but I feel like this, our, as, as a board, our op we have an opportunity to actually look at whether it actually does fit and have deleterious effects on surrounding on the surrounding neighbors i think there are water issues that street is extremely narrow when i drove down that street it was narrow in sort of summertime conditions i can't imagine what it'd be like in winter um, the water issues and the water going onto the neighbor's properties i think is going to continue to be an issue um, are you affected by the logic that No. No. And because I think it ends up, constant, as has been pointed out, it, I think it ends up concentrating in certain areas. How that plays out, will it be better or not? I don't know. I don't think that is easily um, uh, projected uh, until it's built. There's going, the whole area is going to get reworked. Um, areas that may be semi-permeable now might turn into might be covered and become impermeable other areas you know we don't I, I I'm not sure that the engineered solution here is actually going to turn out to be a positive impact on the neighbors okay I took him on anyone else want to mm -hmm. yeah I don't think I agree um, <clears throat> I don't think this board will ever see an application for infill where the neighbors show up and say, ah, oh, we're thrilled to have that wonderful wooded space filled with houses. That will not happen. Nobody wants, I would not want, no, none of us would prefer to have development next to us that would result in taking away green space, but the zoning allows it. I think this is a perfectly appropriate um, application of the new zoning that allows infill. I think it could be way worse. Um, the only way it could be better is if <laughs> it's <laughs> space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, I think they've gone out of their way to make it as inobtrusive as possible. Not that anybody in the neighborhood will be happy to have the houses there. I think they being one story, they'll fit in much better. I mean, talk about bad developments. Day Avenue um, that we approved, in my opinion, looks horrible. It stands out like three huge yellow thumbs um, in, in that neighborhood. It looks totally inappropriate, but we approved it. And I think this will look... Um, uh, so continuing, continuing to... So I I would favor it. And uh, anyone else want to weigh in? This is URB, correct? Right. It's URB. So I mean, just to your point, Dan, you know, the choice isn't development or no development. The the development is going to happen, and the zoning has has laid out 
areas of the city where we're expecting this level of density. I mean, as opposed to out in our conservation land and out off on 66. I mean, you know, we all live somewhere, so we all have neighbors. I mean, we understand what it what it means, but I think he has done a very good job of not chopping up the parcel into four slivers and and selling them to three cousins and you know having these little houses. I think he's done a very good job, and and this is this is an URB the kind of infill that we would expect. Yeah, and I think um, sort of taking stepping back a little bit, you. The, Planning Board worked extensively on uh, and with community input over the years to develop a sustainability plan and then follow that up with regulatory um, changes that would implement that with the goal of um, directing new growth in these areas that are walkable, accessible to schools, um, um, village centers, downtown, et cetera. Um, in with the goal of building more sustainable units and sustainable communities and providing different housing types um, to address the various needs at different income levels, at different um, family status levels. And that means things will look differently. Neighborhoods aren't going to stay the same um, from here forward. They won't stay the same even if, if no changes were made. <laughs> Um, to the zoning, so I think from a, the city's perspective, and you all have been, um, you know, longstanding participants in that as well as city council, to say we need to look at how we're developing, and that does mean that if we're going to embrace this and build in a more sustainable way, that um, new construction isn't going to look like it did a hundred years ago. Um, and we also do have mixed neighborhoods, and you saw examples of that, that not every house is the same anyway, that um, there's been build out throughout the decades within the century. Well, and mostly our meetings turn out to be that sort of overarching common good in the old British sense of the word that's good for the community, and then what's happening next door. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's uh, what was happening next door was nothing. It was a big mostly falling down house and empty lot and that's um, that's not really taking the city forward with a tax base or a um, an ability to grow in a way that's supported by our utility so I mean I I get the conflict believe me um, I I don't see that we should turn back our infill zoning to, to because of that though yes sir uh, my name is Mark Jarvis I send you a letter um, Yes, I read your I read your letter. I think that people are appreciative of the idea of infill and, and, and what good sense it makes for the future of the city. I don't think we need to put a year's quota of infill onto one piece of land. If it was more moderate, if it was two buildings with four living units, I don't think anybody would be here tonight. Yeah. I think people would think that's perfectly reasonable. Let's be clear about one thing. This development has nothing to do with rain gardens and bees and PV cells. It has to do with making money. Yeah, and right. we're trying, and someone is trying to make money at the cost of our community. We embrace infill. We do not embrace infill at the level that's being proposed. Thank you. I, I, I certainly understand. And just to offer some perspective, I've been on that side of the audience as well and had 10 acres of green space and trees disappear next to my house, literally, um, by the actions of this board, which I am now <laughs> part of. So I can appreciate you know, why the, the level of concern. Um, but I, I think I have to, to, to echo a little bit of what uh, Tess was saying. You know, a, a community, our community has set priorities around development as a community. Uh, and Lord knows we sat through a lot of meetings and heard a lot of folks like you and, and came up with these, these zoning changes. Um, and, a, and a city is a, is a living, breathing thing. It, it doesn't stay the same. It's not Disneyland. You know, it's not, you know, it, it changes. 
don't is this? Any, I don't wait, think wait, 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 excuse wait, me, wait, sir. Wait, you, I read your letter and you interrupted at that point. Please be nice. You know, are there alternatives to this development? I'm sure there are, but this is the one that's in front of us. <coughs> um, could it be better? I'm sure it could. Could it be worse? I'm sure it could. Uh, but I think given the parameters and the, and the application that's come forward, it, it seems like a pretty good alternative to what's there today. Ann, do you have any comments? I, I, I just want to reiterate, though. I think the, and I, the city, and I totally, I totally agree with well, I mean, I think it's our good goals, to hear us try to our, work through it. Our goals and the goals and objectives of the city and trying to balance that with the concerns of the, the local community, which also includes non-people, the trees, the, the and all of that is, is trying to, we're trying to balance all of that. The, what zoning allows in its worst case doesn't mean that well, because it's not that, it's good. And I, I come back to that this is, an, this is out of place. It is an island of something in a, an expanse of very different. And we should balance that, that having, you know, as, as has been suggested by some of the neighbors, two units or three units, something that is less dense that would allow for more off-street parking. And I mean, the absurdity of ours, of the zoning, to, to not, to want fewer parking spaces on a street like this tells you that there's a problem with our zoning. To me, anyway, that's, that's my feeling. And I see it repeating itself over and over again. Parking gets worse and worse. There seems to be no real thinking about parking. And it's like, well, we want to encourage people to walk and bike. Well, that's great. Well, where are they going to walk and bike to from Hinkley Street? Their jobs in, you know, Springfield? No. Uh, people need to drive. And so it just, it's not balancing properly for me. And I, from the stand, my, my vote at this point would, would be absolutely no for this development as it stands. I think that there's room for, for change. Do you recognize that the, that the original plans were denser and that it's gone in that right direction for you? Okay. I just, I respect your opinion, but I do want to say that this, I think that people are thinking about parking and doing parking studies and looking at things. I don't think, I live downtown for a reason. I made a trade off to not have a backyard and give up a car for a reason. And I think it's it's just not fair to say that the city hasn't done parking counts and parking studies when so much of downtown is asphalt. I mean, that's that's terrible. We have a lot of parking. I mean, we've done, I don't think that, I think there are a lot of people who aren't sitting around kind of saying, we're just gonna snap our fingers and people are gonna walk. Well, and bike. for years I sat on the Transportation and Parking Commission and the traffic calming was always the biggest issue. It was very rarely street parking was needed. It was much more, please slow down the cars that are going to kill my kid. And that's the, that is the sort of overarching um, argument that comes before that committee. And The statement was made that there's less parking than they originally would have put in there that the city discharged parking apparently. Um, there's a requirement um, for one space per thousand square feet of area. So um, I think that um, I'd have to look at the um, square footage count again, but I think there were some units that were at a thousand or below. Is that correct? So no matter, so all, any units that are less than a thousand square feet would only require one parking space, yet they're providing two per. And we know that the car ownership has dropped. We know that that's yeah. the trend yeah. um, going forward. I understand that. I'm not thinking so much about the car parking per se as I am thinking about the visitor parking, which if these were lined up in that soldier-like fashion with 15 foot, there's 
a lot of space behind where people actually might have been able to park cars in an alternative view of the world. And I just, um, you know, I'm trying to think about what, what kind of balance with the same number of units there. I mean, if there, if there were indeed eight units lined up, one, two, three, four, they would be able to park behind those houses, would they not? I mean, that's my question. I'm just... You can't tell them where to put their parking once you've got the curb cut. I mean... That's you know. all I'm saying is they can't, they could park behind the houses. If there were parking provided there. Well, they could right. also, uh, you know, you can double park if it's a temporary situation. In a driveway, in yes. In a driveway behind the garage bays. I mean, there's, um, there are, a, particularly if there's a snow emergency, you know, I don't, I, I think that um, there's still, there's some bit of wiggle room on the site to, um, to, to do that. But again, as in any street on the city where there's not restricted parking, mm -hmm. um, people can park on the street and for visitor parking that happens all over yeah, the city. This is not, a, this is not, it, this is not easy is all I'm saying. It's a motion to close the hearing in order? Uh, I'll, let me take, I'll finish up the comments, but we, we are going to close it pretty soon. Actually, a quick question. Yes, sir. I've never really heard an answer to the question, like what happens, probably not if, but when the runoff system fails? Yeah. The question is what happens if the runoff system as designed right. doesn't Laura's, hold the water? What is Laura's recourse? Um, if she has a flooded yard, um, the town says, well, that's too bad, it's progress. You know, what's, what's the issue with that? Who does she have recourse against if and when this happens? Um, the, the design for the stormwater distributes the existing flow into three different locations. Yeah, onto her shown, property and his property. Um, there's also current flow coming off this property to the other properties. It's the natural drainage um, yeah. pattern. Parking lots and roofs and it's going to change things drastically. Um, so the system is designed to um, take the, the runoff for those existing impermanents. Well, wait, wait, let her answer. And um, if um, I mean they they're they're bound by a stormwater management um, permit and plan that'll be recorded at the registry of deeds. They are um, the end users will then be part of um, ownership responsibilities. Um, they need to show that in the um, Upon completion, that the that the it's been constructed as designed. Um, so this happens quite regularly, where um, you know these systems get designed all the time. Sometimes they're not constructed the way they were intended to be designed, and then they have to go back and correct those um, those structures. But um, at the back end of construction, there's typically, and I didn't recall seeing that, but maybe the applicants can indicate whether. Um, you have a requirement to submit an as built for um, with final elevations as part of the stormwater management plan. I and mean, that's pretty standard. So um, um, uh, the, the system will be checked at the end of construction. Okay. So you still haven't answered my question though. What, what is her recourse if things fail? If in five years from now her yard's flooded from their rainwater, who does she turn to? Well, if the system is not operating the way it was um, designed, then the then the property owners will be responsible for addressing that. The building it's an owners the condo. association. Yeah. Yes. So okay, that condo. sounds I sue a condo. fair. I hear you. Wait a minute. I think the question is. How is that enforced? By the building inspector, if okay. she's if she I has. Think that's that's oh. the question. So, so if it's failing, who would she go to to make a complaint, and who would actually deal with it at the city? 
So um, ultimately, currently, Department of Public Works oversees the stormwater permitting. So it's not the building commissioner wouldn't be enforcing a stormwater permit. It would probably be DPW. There is, it's not clear, I mean, it is true that, um, you know, there has to be some level of proof that whatever's happening on the parcel is directly related to this, to this project. There may be other factors that, that um, influence that. So there would be some level, level of work that would have to be done um, outside of any city enforcement, I mean, to bring that proof essentially to the city to say, hey, this is failing, this is not working. So, okay, so, so in other words, then, if she gets flooding on her property, then she's going to have to turn around and prove it wasn't because it was not that property that caused this issue. She's going to... Right. I, I mean, it's, it's hard it's a to... Gray. It is gray, but it is hard. I would say that it's probably hard to pinpoint one source. Um, I mean, there would have to be an analysis of what's causing the problem. What is the problem? Where is it coming from? So... Um, at that point, if it's clear that it's coming from this project, the, 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 they're bound by not um, putting any more water off the site than what's running off the site now. That's the standard. And that's the standard for any project, even if it doesn't require um, additional permitting um, by the planning board. So wet backyards will still probably be wet backyards if that's what you have now. but the growing on moist soil. Right. That's what I have. I don't have flooding. I'm talking about if my yard turns back into swamp, which it probably was in 1930 when they built these storm systems because in 1930 they didn't appreciate wetlands and they put in these drains to dredge them. Right. That's all well and fine. I benefited eventually because I got to buy a home on a piece of land that probably never would have been built on. Okay, so I understand that in progress, right? You in the back, sir. So it, it, it seems to me that there are like uh, two really important parts to this project that, that are coming from the city's end that have to happen. There's these adaptations to the drainage system, yeah? And, uh, and presumably that includes the drainage system that's going along Hinkley. And there's some kind of modification that might be done to need, need to be done to the sewage system. I'm not. Sure, I, I wasn't clear over that whether it was just the drainage system that needed to be readapted. Um, I think I can answer. Listen to my answer and see if it's right. Um, the sewage system needs to be pumped up to hit the sewer. Oh well, I understand that part. That is not unusual. Okay, no, but the main sewer doesn't need anything more doing to it. It's just the drainage system in Hinkley that needs to be fixed. Is that fair? Drainage system in. Hinkley. We're reworking the drainage system. system on Hinkley. The storm drain on Hinkley. The storm drain, yeah, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm missing the terminology. Sand. These aren't contingent. These, the project proposed and that don't depend on each other. They don't depend on each other at all. Okay. That's okay, fine. thank you. One more, you, sir. And it also seems it's not just, it's not the zoning, it's the people that buy the houses, tear them down, and then develop it after. The, Every house is still here, and the zoning is not an issue until someone buys the house, tears it down. It happened two houses up from my house on Route 66, you had just mentioned. They put in a cul-de-sac. Now, they require two acres out there, but they were given some land, so now they were able to have three-quarter acre lots, half-acre lots up there in this cul-de-sac. We have two-acre lots up there. And it's the people that buy the houses and then tear them down and then make developments after, and it's maybe it's something that could be addressed. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to move this along. Alan? Uh, I'll move to close the hearing. Alan moved to close public hearing. Second. Second by Ann. All in favor? So we now can't ask the developer any more questions. We'll debate it among ourselves, and then we'll vote. Thank you for all of your comments. I'm sure you're going to stay and listen, but I just, we're going to complete the process tonight but I just um, I wanted to, to let you know what we're doing I stand by my <laughs> so yeah 
Um, any other um, comments before we bring it to a vote? Are there are there any questions that we still have that are unanswered? So much not, but that's good. Apparently, So they've issued the permit. Okay. What are the and they add? Um, that uh, prior to construction or issuance of a building permit, there be um, a completed operation um, management for operation inspection and maintenance um, agreement has been approved by the DPW. So that operation operated. and maintenance agreement will go in the condo papers? Right. Right. Okay. Um, and that um, we've already shown, um, I'll delete this one, they, uh, um, they are asked for level lip spreaders to be shown at the edge of those outlets, so that's mm -hmm. been done in okay. the plans. Um, and those outlets go into rock? Um, don't the rock spreads? The, they're, um, yeah, they yeah. said there was rock along there. Yeah, there's rock right at the edge, but then it spreads out to the glass. Okay. And, but it's according to the DPW's requirements, so yep. recommendations. And um, um, they asked that a note, and it may have been included in the plans, I haven't had a chance to check that um, the existing water line that's going to be abandoned um, be done so in, in accordance with DPW standards. Um, and they want the private sewer manhole uh, place. Um, Boundaries entirely on the private side of the lots, um, and then they want to be able to review construction plans 30 days prior to the request for a building permit. Um, the other there, there's one other issue about protecting the mature trees on the property mm -hmm. that um, that there should be a condition about. Um, having the city inspect that tree protection before any site work's done. Those are on the north side of the property. Are there concerns that you want to talk about that would be conditions? Um, I'm Condominium documents, yeah. making sure that there are appropriate checks for regard to operations and things so you know, it's something that you know, and I think the DW said that is yeah. Right. So that's, that's part a, of a the check. Con that's part of the permit, the stormwater permit, is that they have to have that recorded. Um, uh, the maintenance uh, agreements, and actually, that reminds me, there was a comment too about modifications of the lights. Maybe the light fixtures would be changed out. Right. So anything that but we do have stand, you know, even five years from now, we have we do have standards for the type of fixtures that are allowed. We don't allow uplighting. Currently, I can only imagine that those standards are going to become uh, tighter and uh, in the future. When we have city property, I mean, we have commercial property, we have um, concerns expressed about the stacking of snow. And this is leaving this in a kind of funny fashion. I mean, are we telling the condo association that they can't stack the snow on this and have all that? water <coughs> down subsequently or can they just do whatever they feel like doing? Uh, oh, 
with the snow. I mean, many condo associations have room enough to take it off, but there's not a lot of room in here for, right. for the snow. Is there? I think you could go, I, I mean, I, I don't think it would hurt to have a condition that's, that's cl clear that says that snow cannot be plowed into the rain gardens. But I think it's a, um, I think there's, there's potentially an interest of the end users to take that snow away so it's not stacking up against the garages or um, blocking you know, their own sight lines. So. Or parking spaces. Right, parking spaces. So, uh, you know, it may be a self-policing, uh, easily self-policed from that perspective. But, you know, you, you certainly are well within um, your yeah. limits to require right. a certain point or stipulations about where that snow can go. Yeah. Well, we've certainly done it with businesses. We certainly have. And this is, they're, go I mean, likely a condo association is going to have snow removal as a service. Yes, I would think they would, but snow removal doesn't necessarily mean snow removal. It only means snow removal. I mean, that's not the same thing. Um, well, I think the con... Yes. <laughs> I mean, I will say, you know, as someone who lives in a condominium with an association, it is absolutely in our interest and preference to make sure we have enough money to pay for physical removal because we don't, we can't afford to lose parking spaces to piles right. of snow, yeah. period. I mean, there's no advantage for the people living there to, to be lazy about it or, or to be dismissive about it. You know, I mean, that, there is an incentive for them to do that. Okay. Um, Want to have a discussion about uh, plantings and uh, a desire to increase some of the, uh, decrease some of the sight lines? I mean, I'm having I, I I'm recognize that if you're looking into the woods, that's old mature woods, and light gets through. The question, to some extent, was that. The one of butter was interested in having something along the edge there that I thought I heard the developer say he would do. I don't know if that's the case or not. <laughs> I think what they said is that it wasn't, it wasn't included in the planting plan because there was so much <clears throat> mature vegetation off site. Well, no, not that down at the corner. I was thinking yeah. further up where she wanted the, uh, the black arbor vitae. <coughs> I don't see any reason. Yeah, I mean, I, well, yeah, what, so I'm what just I think is I, I appreciate not cutting the tree trunks. I mean, I, the, the drought is, is wrecking havoc yeah, with the is. area it maples. Um, but if there are smaller uh, deciduous bushes that could come out and that could go in instead, I think that would go a long way. You know, I would encourage, maybe that's the word to be used. But you we know. can't condition, I mean, That's we have to right. either condition or not condition. Well, so oh, we, we can encourage it and they can hear it. It doesn't mean right, they right, have right. to we do it. We could add it to the measure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd rather, I'd rather take a more measured approach and ask for a certain number to be replaced and not, and, and to be done so with the landscape architect's decision about where it's not bad on trees and where it's good for the placement. Um, uh, does anybody have a magic number that they think might be able to help in that regard? Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, I, and I mean it's I going to have to one of the comments was not necessarily about the number, but about a specific location species and style. That yeah, species. Somebody wanted. I, you know, I, if I were developing a parcel, I, I would, and I hired a landscape architect, I would want it to defer to that person's professional judgment. So, I personally wouldn't want a condition that specifies, you know, this species in this spot because an abutter has asked for that particular species in that spot. I would defer to the judgment of the landscape architect. Okay, that's fine. Um. Though there is a recommended condition about a hazard tree. A hazard tree. Um, oh, that's so the one going to be right so Sorry, in order to, in order to so there's a memo that i passed a sick tree right. and last time they suggested 
that it not be that it not be required to be replaced because it was sick and didn't count it as right right a significant right. tree and, and so the tree water didn't provided that letter right so the requirement is that um, a certified arborist provide um, an analysis of a tree um, by the tree board yeah. Right, so they've submitted they've submitted their own arbor study. So the the um, basically there could be a condition that says you know, the tree, we just uh, I don't think the tree warden has reviewed this yet. Yeah. Um, so that still needs to happen. So we would add a condition that the tree warden re review the arborist opinion. Right. Just on this one particular tree, yep. right? Right, right, right? Otherwise, so it would be considered a significant. Yeah, right. right, and require like the adequate replacement. Right, but now it's no longer significant. Traffic mitigation have to be right. a condition, or is that just a? No. So what they're um, so the zoning does allow the board to waive traffic mitigation if it's not if the project could be done with the same number of units by right. So they're asking for you for that consideration from the board. So it, there wouldn't be a condition if you. Um, um, you know, acknowledge the analysis they did that shows that they could do this project by right, um, which the zoning allows no traffic mitigation. In that I thought their application said that they were prepared to pay the traffic. Well, or or originally, but then they suggested that in fact, um, they noted that the number of units is the same as what would be allowed by right, so they um, submitted. Um, an analysis based on that. But that's a request from them? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would note in that regard, I'm more pleased with one driveway than I am four. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect how many cars are there, but it certainly affects <coughs> the way they get in and out of the property. And the, the configuration of the driveway allows for those units to turn around and go out head head first if you're a car, as opposed to shotgun driveways that might be backing out onto the road. Mm -hmm. They address essentially safety um, mm -hmm. issues in that design. The, their application says um, the project plans and expects to pay into traffic mitigation funds, which it hopes is target can be targeted for certain things. I don't see a request for a waiver. So um, that was the original application submittal. So in the subsequent documentation that you received tonight, there and what they showed on the screen, yeah, right. what they showed on the screen was the analysis of how um, oh. they are, can build the same number of units by right, and the zoning specifically allows the planning to waive the mitigation. Um, on top of the fact that you know they, they are also this configuration addresses. Um, or mitigate, um, you know, s safety, um, yeah, through their single access point, yeah. and as you mentioned, um, head out the safety factor. Mm -hmm. But it allows; it doesn't require a waiver. Right. right. So, right. It, it, you know, but so it, we don't have to waive it. You don't have to waive it. No. It's your discretion. Any other thoughts before we bring it to a vote? Do you want to settle the waiver by discussion now? Do you, um, I, I'm swayed by the fact that four separate units could go in here and it would be the same exact story. Um, I do a lot of traffic work, so this looks like a really minor addition to traffic patterns in a road to me, but um, I'll be swayed by anyone else's no, opinion. It could, it could be there anyway, so. so can I get a nod on whether we want to approve the waiver? Okay, I've got one no. You, Alan? I think so. And so if we don't, do we also then have to assign the dollar value, the what the fee would be? based on yeah but so I would just say though that um, you know you should um, 
indicate why you think this project has um, incremental impacts over and above what would be um, allowed by right in order not to waive it. Since um, it's the same number of units, right. it would be difficult for us to make right. a strong case for there being more of an impact. That's right. The only impact I can it. see is visitor parking, but if I don't see that situation being different for this any property. They're in any neighborhood any around <laughs> for any yep. picnic park. You know, I mean, it is the visitor parking. It take the parking takes care of the residents above and beyond its need uh, by a couple of slots. I think I, I guess to um, add to that is that going back to that same discussion you all had is that not only is it. Um, the same number of units, but in fact, it's a better situation in terms of the network to have a single source and a single driveway. So they're doing their work towards their impact by consolidating access to one point. So we can't justify not waiving it. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> no, it's welcoming I mean, the argument. Yeah. I, I don't have it. Yeah. 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 There's no argument for it. Yeah. You, sir? Okay. Um, so uh, when we vote on the project, I copied these conditions that would be relevant, and we would ask that the condo documents contain operations and maintenance requirements for the rain gardens, operation and maintenance requirements for the stormwater runoff system, uh, recognition that the light fixtures need to be zero lot line if any of them are replaced in the future so that they would that would really essentially be matching our code um, that the snowpack removal uh, that the snowpack be removed uh, if it in any way impacts the uh, street runoff or the rain garden um, and that um, the tree warden receive the arborist opinion on the hazard tree ultimately has to sign off on, on accepting that. Receive, sign, s sign off on. Any other notes that matter? Okay. Um, what about the traffic mitigation? Is that a condition or is that something? I, I wouldn't say it is a condition uh -oh. that you would, in your motion, if you're uh, making a motion to uh, approve the permit, that you would approve it with oh, okay. the requested traffic mitigation fee waiver. So for the conditions as listed and a waiver of the traffic fee mitigation, can I get a motion? I move. So move. Alan moves that we accept the Special permit and site plan for eight residential units by New Harmony Properties LLC at 121 Hinkley Street, Florence Map ID 23D 149. Allen motioned second. and seconds. All in favor? All opposed? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've only got one more. Oh my God. Some two more projects to come, oh, but yeah, sorry. Is your contact huge stretch of open space. So we have uh, scheduled for eight o'clock. So you does anyone need a break? Yes, they could be cut. It could still be cut. Okay. Mark, welcome back. That it's almost develops the entire one is this? Uh we are um it's just a little mahogany subdivision. Opening uh discussion. That's not right. I'm lost my Open. 
Yeah. Open a public hearing on site plan for 18 new parking spaces at O'Donnell Development Group for Michael's House, 71 State Street, Northampton Map ID, 31B-310. Is there anyone here to give us a presentation on the parking addition at Michael's House? Yes. Hi there. I'm Andrew Crystal. I'm with McConnell Companies. We're the owners of Michael's House. Carolyn, did, do you have the electronic version of our submission? We didn't bring it. Did you send it to me? We dropped off the CD. When? Today? No, uh, right after, we, when we dropped off the building permit application. That had the presentation? Yes. Okay. Headboard. Okay, let's you can do it. the old fashioned way. Sorry, and I can try to find it on here. Okay. And well, then I can put it up. I will give you a brief introduction, then I'll have our engineer explain the technical part. <clears throat> Michael's house is um, property we redeveloped about 25 years ago, the old St. Michael's School. It's primarily Section 8 housing. It's mostly seniors or some disabled um, residents. I have our property manager, Christine, here with us, and our regional facilities manager. There's 39 parking places there, 81 units, 81 apartments. 80 apartments, there's 39 parking places. And what we found over the last several years is the aging population is getting younger at heart and more of them are driving. <clears throat> so as I noted in the application, over the last year, we've had 12 residents leave. Of those 12 residents, two had cars they parked in the lot. The 12 that moved in, six of them have cars. So we just added four. We've got a waiting list of six people ready to move in. Five of them plan to bring cars. So what's happened is the parking lot's not large enough and it's forcing people to park out in State Street. So the um, plan as John goes through you, there's an existing driveway that is a service drive that goes to the dumpsters in the back of the building existing. We plan to leave the curb cut there, add nine spaces on either side of that, uh, add the proper detention. We've worked with uh, DPW for several months trying to come up with a plan that they felt was acceptable. Um, and use that parking primarily for staff who arrive in the morning, stay during the day, leave in the evening. Residents will all be able to park on the south side of the building closer to Sirio is where the main entrance to go in and out is. So it's really the, the simple explanation. Um, we'd like to be able to get approved with conditions tonight. Uh, we've got about eight weeks till the paving plants close and we're hoping to get this done before winter. So we can keep people off of State Street. And John, can you give us a technical presentation? Good evening. John Fairman, I'm the managing director of VHB in Springfield. Uh, so is this set up fine so everyone can see it? So I'll start with the uh, overview of the existing conditions plan. Uh, so this is a survey of the, the northern uh, portion of the property. Uh, the curve cut that we were referring to when we were using it for the parking lot is actually existing. You can see it right through here. This is really a dead-end drive into the parking area. It goes into a small area, a little alcove on the uh, end of the buildings or between the buildings. It also accesses the two dumpsters. There is no way to get around the building at all. Um, from that point forward. <clears throat> what we're looking to do is basically uh, widen the drive aisle on either side and create two small parking areas for nine vehicles each. So going to our sheet C2, you can see the, the two parking areas outlined. Uh, it's actually a combination demolition plan as well. So this area will be stripped of the vegetation. There's a current sidewalk that goes from the end of the building out to the, the pavement area. Um, and we need to actually relocate the end of it. So we're just actually taking the uh, about 15 to 20 feet of the end of that off, moving it over a little bit, and then uh, and, and repouring it. Uh, the parking area, we're keeping the existing curb cut at its existing width of 16 and a half feet. And as you get into where the spaces are, the drive and where the parking areas have to be accessed, it widens out to 24 feet, but the curb cut itself will be maintained at 16. Uh, nine parking spaces either side. Uh, they're basically 
Um, they're, they're not signed for any particular purpose, but uh, we're intending to use them mostly for staff and vendors that visit the site during the day. Uh, Andrew had given a, a, a small uh, discussion about uh, the need for additional parking here, and these 18 spaces will bring uh, the total on property up to 57. Uh, when you get to our next page, which is sheet C3, it is the grading plan. Uh, again, keeping the existing sidewalk and the curb cut where it is, uh, we've uh, come across the sidewalk. The sidewalk is continuous across the driveway. So there is a small little apron. Uh, the pavement uh, hits onto the gutter line. Uh, the apron goes up about six inches over a distance of about two feet. Sidewalk is three foot wide, and then it goes into our drive aisle. Um, the way we have this graded is uh, the, 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 the water is directed to the center of the, the parking area until it gets down into here and then it is directed over to the side. What this area is over here is a detention basin that we have uh, constructed. Uh, it is very shallow, it is only about two and a half feet deep and the uh, hatching that you see in this area here is a, is a riprap stone hatching to allow for access to the soils uh, during the winter months. Um, the uh, basin itself has a berm constructed around the outside of it, and then there is a, another uh, riprap swale going to an existing catch basin on site, and that is the overflow outlet for it. That basin, catch basin outlets into the uh, existing collection system, which is on site. Uh, in this area here, there's three or four piping uh, systems going to a central catch basin, and then that, that system goes uh, around the building to the far property line, and then connects into the collection system on Gothic, on Gothic Street. Um, so we have sized this uh, system so that uh, it, it is able to mitigate the increase in runoff from the additional pavement that we're proposing here. So of the, the additional paving that we're adding is basically these areas here in dark, and that's approximately 3,300 square feet. Um, so we have uh, prepared a stormwater management report um, and we've submitted it as part of the application. Uh, for all the storms, th this area on the north side was modeled for the stormwater management report. And for all the storms that we have, this system here is reducing the amount of peak flow from this project <coughs> on all three storms. I can give you the numbers if you need to have those for the record. Um, we have not done any soil testing uh, on the site here. We have uh, basically have a, I wanted to correct something that Doug uh, had uh, provided some comments, and I think he had quoted in his comment a two minute per inch perp rate. Um, it's actually two inches per hour, um, and, and that's, that's significant because it two, two minutes per inch is sand and it, it goes in. Two inches per hour is a medium rate, and it's based on the urban soils that uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, identified in the, uh, in the uh, record soils information. Uh, when we get into construction, we plan to do a, uh, uh, a test pit out here where we have machinery on site to, to confirm uh, that assumption, but we did use a conservative uh, <coughs> based on the experience that we have in that area. Um, there's no change in use associated with this. We're just um, not having and, and anticipating any uh, impact from traffic as a result of this project. The uses are there. We're not adding any apartments. It's just giving people additional place to park so that uh, they don't have to use the parking spaces that are on State Street. And that's really all I had. I can answer questions. Question. Um, you said you haven't done any test pits now, but you will during construction. I know there's concerns about the neighbors on the Gothic side. Yes. Because of runoff. So if you get in, you do a test pit and you find it's, it's just clay soil, it's bad, then what's the... Well, we, we have looked at that. So, and uh, we, we met with uh, um, Anthridge beforehand to discuss it with. So. Their property in question is, is the property over on the side here. And the clay soil, their property itself, elevation-wise, is six to eight feet lower than the elevation that we have here. Their building is kind of unique, where the foundation is in a full eight feet below grade. It's only about four feet. And it was at that four foot below grade elevation that they encountered clay soils. Um, so if you take from the bottom of their foundation where they encountered the clay, and then account for the difference in elevation up to here, we're anywhere from eight to 10 feet higher than where, where they are. We're only going down two and a half feet, and we're fairly confident we're not gonna encounter any clay soils uh, in, that, in that strata. We'll go down deeper with our per test or our, uh, our test pit uh, to make sure, 
but uh, we have done uh, manual excavations throughout the site for a number of reasons, fence post signs and stuff like that. We've never hit clay we've done at that depth, so we're not anticipating it to be an issue. All right. what, what kind of conditions can you put so that, worst case scenario, they do find clay, and it's just the, the analysis they've done beforehand in due diligence is it just doesn't match what they find in the field. So um, it sounds like um, there was a discussion before the meeting at Etheridge actually um, dropped off um, a note that he said that he, um, he talked to you about two conditions that mm -hmm. um, he'd support uh, the board putting one of them is to do a test um, of a soil test and that um, to confirm that their assumptions about um, how it would function and that they um, would support the project with that w w condition one and then the second condition would be to uh, about the redesign of the entrance which I don't know if you went over and I missed it or um, we did not and okay. that, that's actually a good segue so I can I can Wait, talk I, about that. before you get into that yeah. one I've got more questions about that. does the DPW have they seen a stormwater plan this did um, they reviewed the stormwater this does not require a separate stormwater application and it's not a major project so it's not um, but they did nevertheless look at the, um, the they went back and the reviewed the stormwater plan that was with the building when it was first done 25 years ago no, no, no. for this project when they submitted the application DPW did review that okay. but it's not a separate um, stormwater permit application but they just reviewed it as part of site plan. So they don't need a DPW approval for the riprap and the. No. No. That's no. It's just the planning board site plan. Hmm. Mark. So just following up on my comments. So the so the butter says uh, we're okay if you guys do a test pit, which is fine. But I'm saying, what if the test pit proves to be bad and the, the design, as shown, isn't going to work? How is that enforced to use the information? drawn from the test pit to actually do something different? Well, so, um, because what they're showing uh, um, assumes that, um, and they're explaining how the water is going to be managed if it's not going to work that way because the soils are indicative of something else, then they have to come back and um, propose something that will address the runoff the way they had anticipated it. So they don't necessarily have to come back to the planning board. Actually, DPW had already proposed a condition that um, um, a certified professional soil scientist complete a test pit and submit recommend doc written documentation of the soil types um, to and to the extent that there are any restrictive soils um, in the proposed basin that, um, that um, there's a confirmation that they're going to uh, that there won't be a change in the expected infiltration rates and so if there is then they have to do some okay. modification okay. and then that can be done that can be reviewed at a staff level because they're presenting that they're going to deal with the stormwater in a certain situ in a certain way and they um, may find out information yeah. later that <laughs> uh, makes them I'm change uh, the way I'm just surprised that. that you would go to this level of development you would have plans and, and, and you wouldn't dig a three-foot test pit I mean, I just, I don't, that, I don't understand why you would go about it in that way, but. We have no reason to suspect there's clay there. We have enough information for what we've done on the site to know that going down two and a half feet is not going to be a problem. Okay. Mar, uh, Alan. What about planting between the new parking lot and the abutting houses? Uh, it'll be one the way that it is right now. So we're, we're not planning on any uh, any landscaping, it's just, it's lawn now. Um, we're actually excavating it out, creating a more uh, even slope so the water doesn't have these ups and downs as it flows across the parking lot to assist it. And then we're just from the top of curb, we're gonna fill it with loam and just loam and seed it. Except that it's not gonna be lawn anymore, it's gonna be asphalt. Right. Well, you were talking about the area between the parking lot and- Which is lawn now and yes. it's going to become asphalt. Yes. So when your staff comes in at seven in the morning, all those lights are gonna go in a house next door. Uh, They're going in there. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, and into your residence houses also. Well, the, Isn't there- Just like the parking lot on the other side. Yeah. 
Um, but well, the majority, majority of that is residential right. parking that isn't coming and going at mm -hmm. 7 in the morning but or whatever your shift change is. Carolyn, isn't there a screening requirement? Um, not per se, but I think it makes sense to require at least a three foot high, you know, green screen to protect, to block the headlights from for along that edge. And because the and the yeah. visual. And the visual, yeah. yeah. Cars, right. And that's been a fairly standard. Yeah. Yeah. Were there any other designs considered besides sort of that yeah. two opposing? Uh, we did have one that actually went a lot longer, um, but we were trying to you know, mitigate and create a balance with stormwater. Um, we're very limited, it, you know, and it's tough to see what we have here, but you know, we have the existing building here and the property owner here. Dumpsters are here. There's no access around it. it there's just not a lot of room back there. There was a suggestion that when this was set up, that was supposed to have been open space. Is there something oh, right. to that effect? I mean, that was in there some was of the letter. letter from from there was a letter that, that it said they wanted to acquire that long ago right. for conservation, but that they couldn't because there was a some kind of covenant on this property that they couldn't acquire that sliver. So they're question was is that not still in place that it be green space um, I will look at that it was a letter from the grants that said um, right in 79 they tried to buy a piece of land next to Michaels but were told they couldn't uh, sell any of it uh, Michaels couldn't sell the land due to zoning uh, regulations that dictate they keep a certain amount of open green space um, I'll check that I mean the open space requirements have changed over time, and now there's a minimum 30% open space, so they're meeting that. Open space means lawn and, and not pavement right, not or pavement. building. Okay. And they're meeting the 30%. I think that's what the table said. Can you read the table? I, don't know. I can't remember what the percentage was. Um, if this was a new development, what kind? No, I'm sorry, I think it was in the application. Yeah. Okay. If, if this were a new development, what would the parking requirements be? Um, urban. Well, it's how many units? 81. <laughs> 81 units. I think it's half for senior or um, housing, so maybe 40 or 40. something. I'm going to guess. 41.9. Is that what it says? 41.9. What is the open space then? So they actually have enough or they have, nearly. They have the current requirement with short one or one and a half or something. But the nature of the residence has changed. But, yeah, I'm just concerned that there's no other alternative to paving over, the, that we've got so much, so many parking lots downtown already, you know, and so many alternatives. It's just. It's just too bad that there isn't an, al an alternative to adding this much. Well, particularly when we're doing a parking study downtown. Right. You know, um, I, I, I don't think the applicant would want to go through the expense of doing this project if they didn't really feel it was needed. But I parked on the most easily available space on State Street today. There were 12 empty spaces in your lot of 41 at 1 in the afternoon. I'm, 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 I'm leaning like Tess. It's like I just hate to keep making space for cars. I know I just, I know we're fixing to turn the corner on better ways to, you know, we've, we've gotten a circulator bus in town now. We've got um, um, a parking study to try to look at, you know, putting parking elsewhere. I mean, I realize it's your parking, and, and um, but I, I can't not say that, that it just bothers me to keep paving over green space. I think that's a valid argument, but this is that's a that's a special permit argument. This is a site plan review, <laughs> right. and so our hands are are very much tied. It's it's just a regulatory thing. They can do it; it's their property. They're within the bounds. We can maybe require a, a screen or sea hedge, and and make sure the drainage is good, and we can yeah. be sad about it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll get to it. Um, can I address the, the driveway? Yeah. So um, as we were going through the stormwater management report, I met Doug uh, McDonald on site uh, a couple times and reviewed his concerns. So 
Uh, the concern, as we had started to say, is actually with this property here. And uh, apparently, uh, I have no historic knowledge of it, but apparently during some flash rain events, water has backed up in, in State Street. And there's a catch basin, which you can just see in this plan right at the edge of our curb cut. That is the low point of State Street. So under these events, what has happened is the area uh, in front of the driveway is flooded, and the water has gone down the property, gone through the, the terrain that we have back here, gone into the abutting property, and basically followed their ADA ramp down into their basement. Um, he said the first time that happened, I think he said, was 30 years ago? He said there have been three events in the last 20 years. 20 years. And the city's done work to improve State Street since then. It's happened one time to a minor extent since then. So as, as we're meeting with Doug, uh, Doug didn't really have any concern about the infiltration system that we had here. Uh, but he realized that we were, we were managing the increase in stormwater runoff from this project. And we really weren't doing anything to try and help fix that situation which doesn't belong to us. So uh, one of his comments was to think about the design of this driveway to see if we can do something to raise the curb and hold back, if the situation ever happens again, hold back more water in State Street. So his comment was is that to reconfigure the driveway, go out into State Street, and right now the catch basin is in front of the apron, so there's a slope that goes behind it, and then there's a sidewalk, and then it drops down into our property. So what he proposed was to reconfigure the driveway and just put a piece of vertical granite curb behind it, but when we look at our survey, the elevation of the top of that granite curb is the same elevation as the top of the sidewalk. So we're basically making the driveway smaller and we're not really doing anything to raising the elevation. We can't lift the sidewalk because it's continuous between it. So as we were looking at the comment, we came up with an idea that we think will actually be beneficial uh, and that we can actually do fairly easy. So um, it, uh, in the shaded area here, this dark area is, is the property line. And then as we go in through the, you can see the throat of the driveway. So what you would expect if you're standing there looking at the curb, you would see six inches of reveal of curbing on either side. So what we could do is almost create a speed table within that driveway. So as you went across the driveway, we would taper it up to a, about a two inch reveal and then taper it back down. And what that would do is, is provide three more inches, four more inches, simple math, of, uh, of storage for any water that ponds up here. When you look at it in plan view, we were looking at it um, out in the, in the foyer, it only looks like it's just this area here, but if you add four inches of elevation, uh, it, it actually spreads down quite a bit and gives you more storage in there. So, and we're happy to incorporate that design into it. And we think it would be easier and provide a better result than reconfiguring the curb cut to raise the sidewalk. You will never raise that sidewalk four inches and have it not be uh, an issue for cars trying to get in or somebody walking. So we think that is a better thing and we're happy to incorporate that in. So you're putting the raised um, a sort of speed hump in the driveway, in the driveway. Uh, beyond the sidewalk, so on the property yes. side, beyond the sidewalk. From curb to curb. So it basically is creating a small dam. Mark. Can you do something on the, on the, on the back end toward Gothic Street and either, either bring the infiltration design you know, across the back or add a berm in the back or something like that. So that is four inches of rain becomes five inches one day in a big storm. Mm -hmm. There's a big you know, surge of water headed down the driveway, headed toward Gothic Street to, to capture that somehow. Sure, so, so the grading, uh, I guess it's a multi-part answer. So if any water happens to get over that and then starts to head down the driveway, but right now, the, if you can see the existing contour lines, it just directs it straight, it just goes through. So now with the contour lines, we're actually taking this pavement and we're rolling it. So we're pushing that water that would happen to get through and even under normal uh, rain events towards the, this basin. So uh, this basin, again, with the stone that we have planned there is an infiltrating basin. Um, there's an existing catch basin, which is this dark spot right here. And that's our overflow. What's very tough to see just because of the lightness is that that catch basin is about a foot and a half lower than the grade around it. So we, when we modeled our detention basin, we actually modeled this uh, as our volume. But in this area here, that area is also depressed. So it's actually acting almost as a secondary 
type of, of detention system. And then on the property, we have three catch basins to collect that water. You know, one here, one here, and one back over here. So if anything gets into this way, this property itself has a separate drainage system, also has three catch basins. And when they built that, they kind of created a dished area in their lawn area as well. So this is lawn, this is lawn, and then there's pavement back over here. So there's, uh, we were talking to Mr. Etheridge, he said that they had televised this and they had found one of the pipes that, that, that was on their system to be blocked and crushed, so they fixed it. So I think that's all kind of contributing to how it's been acting better in these areas. So you mentioned a three foot wide sidewalk, isn't it wider than that there? The sidewalk is wider, but as the, when you get to the apron, the, the, the three foot goes through and then the apron tapers down to the gutter. So it's about five feet from curb to back of sidewalk, but at the driveways it narrows down. It gets wider. Mark. Last one. Uh, did you say there's a berm on the back side of the infiltration? Here. Oh, well, there's oh, one design. we're constructing right, there, right, right. there. Would it make any sense logistically to whatever the size of that berm is to increase it? To as a as a backstop to any water that's in the in the uh, normal you mean in width in height in, in, in height like the like the table that you're doing in the front yeah same thing with the berm in the back I think if you increase it any more it's going to start actually spreading out and going into the abutting abutting properties okay so we have you can see the contour lines that we have basically come in through here wrap around and, and tie back in so we're at that same elevation that's there right now. And our, 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 our maximum water level is below that grade line, so we're not anticipating that's going to get that high. Okay. Any other questions? You, sir, had a comment? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm one of the abutters. Can I speak? Huh. Uh, I, we have not opened. Well, yeah, we opened yeah. public comment. Sure. Please state your name. I'm David Bruce Sloman. Um, my wife is Priscilla Lane. We own property at 28 Trumbull Road. Um, 28, is that what you said? 28 Trumbull Road, yes. We're vehemently opposed to this parking project. There are other alternatives. First, I want to give you some pictures of what the other side of the lot looks like. With failed to mention, the other side are all commercial buildings. Our side are all residential properties. Here are some pictures that Grants wanted me to show you. We left the letter. This is what the cars look like, and here's what facing our houses and the greenery looks like. Okay. You, you have a copy, you have the letter. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I also have a letter, I'll give you a copy right now. I'd like to just I'll summarize pieces of it. There are other options, at least they haven't been discussed here tonight. We should, I only brought one copy. That's fine. Thank you. This is um, Are you gonna summarize this? Yeah, I'm going to kind of summarize through this. The, the, um, I wanted to mention one of our neighbors couldn't be here. Constance Cogwell lives next door. He's lived there for many years, senior citizen. Very upset and opposed to this project as well. Um, our, our back screened in porch, which is on, I believe not shown on your map, but just really about right here. Our back screened in porch. Currently, when they park cars there in the wintertime and sometimes in the summer when they do maintenance on the lot, the exhaust from it makes it almost impossible to sit on the porch. This is a nuisance. It's a private nuisance. I guess it's not a public nuisance legally, unless the zoning could be really checked out to see that this is something they're allowed to do. Um, the change from greenery to scenic space to asphalt and cars will disrupt the basic enjoyment of our space. There's also a discrepancy in, in, in the proposed plan. Uh, Mr. Furman, I believe, stated that these were to be used by staff. But in the permit uh, application, Section 3 states the property is simply providing 18 additional parking spaces for current residents. So I kind of wonder which it really is. Residents come and go at all hours, staff come and go, but it's still gonna be lights and the exhaust. The exhaust fumes are really what bothers me the most, having tried to sit out there sometimes even in the winter and can't enjoy my porch or that part of my yard. Um, 
To the permit application, uh, number one, it states will protect adjoining premises from serious detrimental uses. It will not. It will decrease property value, allow commercial venture to downgrade pleasant and reasonable use of residential properties. If allowed to go through, all property owners will have a right to apply for substantial tax reductions. Will minimize and mitigate traffic impacts. It will not. There will be 12 to 18 cars daily on this side, closer to this campus school, which already has heavy traffic at eight in the morning and three in the afternoon. Uh, have there been any traffic studies done to see what kind of issues this would create? Pr uh, number three, this is on the traffic application. Will promote harmonious relationship of structures and open space. Come on. <laughs> it will do just the opposite for residents on both sides. The residents inside will now see in the cars and smell the fumes. The asphalt and cars replacing grass and trees do not promote harmonious relationships. Protect general welfare. It harms the residents' enjoyments of their homes, their property values, and adds commerciality to a residential space. Avoiding overlooking mitigate and impacts on city resource. Does it? We're not so sure. Talking about water going through, my basement floods once or twice a year. It always has. I was told when I bought the property, we bought the property in 1996, uh, it used to be a um, canal in this area. The house was built in the 1800s. It's rubble with brick on top. Water comes through the walls. This has not gotten better in any period. I fear that what they're going to do, that suddenly I'm going to go down and my sump pumps no longer be able to keep up with it. That scares me a bit. And we have no proof that anything has been done to address that issue. Avoid overlaying mitigate impacts on city resources, does it? And number six, promote city planning objectives. So is the city planning objective to take, to take uh, private enjoyable property, make it less enjoyable, lower the property values by letting people put parking lots in for more cars? Do we really need more cars? Are there other places to put our car, those cars? There are. I'll give you three examples in just a moment. Meeting all zoning requirements. Has a traffic study been done with the campus school? When we purchased our house in 96, we were told zoning laws prevented the property from expanding in any way on our side. Now, perhaps that you were saying that it's changed, that they met the requirements. I'm, I would hopefully suggest that they be out, checked out thoroughly. There are other options. The owners could reorganize the existing lot and perhaps expand it into the budding lot on the other side where there's commercial properties. Those lots, when you walk through there, almost always half empty. There's an idea. Um, the owners could apply to lease the meter spots along State Street, parking by permit only. You see this on streets in Springfield. You go to Mattoon Street, it's parking by permit only. It could be beneficial to the city, save them a lot of money over the construction, what they have to do. And it, it displaces, some people are parking there, but half the time you go by there on State Street, those, those, those spots are empty anyway. The other alternative is the front of their building. I'm not sure if they show it here, but the front of the building on State Street, they could dig dig up. I don't know how many spots they could fit in, but they could fit sparking spots along the front on State Street. It wouldn't have bought any of the <coughs> any of the residential property. And it would only affect the tenants of their building. Thank you. Does anyone else want to make public comment? Yeah, I just, um, my wife and I live on the corner on 107 State Street. Mm -hmm. Oh, Name and address for the record. Oh, 107 State Street. And your name? Oh, Gary Ostertag. Thank you, Gary. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we moved in 2001, uh, 2011, sorry, and we tried to beautify the property, and we get a lot of compliments when people were working on the bushes and stuff like that on the porch, and lots of people walk by, going to work back and forth, and um, I think it's just, it's a really sweet area, that little block. And, you know, there's, once you hit Sirio's, that area, there's a lot of asphalt. And there was a, a parking lot put on, on the other side of the street as well. And there's kind of gradual, it's starting to look like King Street, not very pretty. 
And the, the, the worry is, you know, people walk past and part of the reason you live here is to, to have this nice experience. And um, I just worry that the, the character of the town is going to change. I mean, it's just gradually, but more and more asphalt. I mean, there, there are just specific issues about the people, the property that are abutting, properties that are abutting the projected lot. And that's, those are serious concerns. And I also have the same concerns about the water runoff because there are serious water issues that we have as well. But even bracketing that, this just the, um, it's, it's almost like an injustice. You move to this town because it's, it's beautiful and people walking there appreciate this and it's, it's important to them. And you know, I, I feel that because people compliment us constantly and they have gratitude about what we're doing to the property. And now um, just adding more asphalt, where there's lots of asphalt already and it's been pointed out, the lot on the other side, go there. Half of the st spots are not used. And uh, you know, so it, it's going to change gradually the character of Northampton. Um, not overnight, but still, it's eking away at that. And um, that's something I, we really have to consider, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Um, both of you, one at a time. <laughs> I can't begin to reach that. That's OK. It'll hear you. All Your right. name? Uh, my name is Dorothy Meehan, and I live on 32 Trumbull Road. I live, uh, well, Bruce lives at the end of my driveway, or his driveway, but I have lived there for 69 years, and we have always had a little bit of green. And if we take away all the green, all we're going to have is carbon monoxide. Plus, we have traffic that goes up from the courthouse, from People's Institute, and from King Street, and from the day school. It's all on State Street. It converges right in there. And you're going to add more parking places and take away our little bit of green that we have, plus the water. He says he's going to fix that. But if you could have seen the water that came down the hill and through that lot, and it, with no place for that water to go into the ground on pavement, it's going to go whoosh. And there we are. Plus, everybody that lives under the hill has got water in their basements. And I've lived there long enough to know that. So I th think it's a very bad mistake to let anybody put parking places where we've got a little bit of food. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Hi. I'm Jennifer Lerner. I'm Park Hill Road Extension. I'm totally unfamiliar with this project until tonight but I'm intimately familiar with sitting in traffic in front of this property on State Street at any number time of days, including weekends. That area has, since I've been here for 16 years, has become a lovely walking area where the community uses it. People are sitting down, they're enjoying the area, um, and there is sparse green right there. Um, between State Street, um, by the Hungry Ghost and that crosswalk, which is difficult enough, and the nightmare that is the next lot, and the number of people who wait sometimes far beyond Michael's for that crosswalk and that lot, the amount of exhaust that people are exposed to is outrageous. Um, the difficulty now will become, I'm afraid, 18 is a lot of cars in an area that apparently already meets its requirement. Um, I'm pretty concerned that what we're going to end up with is a worsening of people cutting through the residential area at Trumbull, uh, Bright Street, and all the way back until the, till they hit the T. Um, and in addition to that, you've got the opposite problem where people get disgusted, they get angry, they get frustrated, and that's when dangerous traffic situations happen. We already have people pulling out to try to get into those parking spaces to do the St. Mary's thing, to jam their way up to the front of that light, and adding 18 cars is of great concern to me for that reason. Thank you. Okay, any other board questions? 
Carolyn, you want to maybe for my benefit review the this being a site plan and not a special permit? Sure. Um, the reason that um, this project is in front of you is that the zoning uh, requires that uh, any expansion of parking of six for six spaces or more <coughs> triggers um, site plan approval. So there's no building construction associated with it. It's really just a technical review to um, address um, drainage, landscaping, access, safety, intersection, you know, conflicts, potential conflicts, um, and technical, other technical aspects, lighting. Um, so it's not um, a special permit in which you would be evaluating the use of the project property. Obviously, the use is already there. That's not changing. So it's really just. Um, uh, I guess I'm bothered by that. The, uh, a, a nice green side yard to a building turning into parking seems like a change in use. It's if nothing more, it's the back of that property is a recre. They have park benches. It's it's an area that they use for residential gathering out on that lawn. Well, I, I mean change of use in terms of the site. The site is still a housing, um, senior housing, and there's parking on one side. So looking at the overall function of the property, that use is not changing. Okay, any other? What you're suggesting is there is no choice to say don't add the parking. There's only a choice to say how you add the parking or how you manage the water, et cetera, and so forth. Right, unless there's some um, unless there's some um, technical reason that this doesn't meet um, standard criteria. I mean, if you think that they're um, you know because of the drainage that the part that the uh, drainage analysis isn't um, accommodating the number of spaces, the parking lot could be reduced. Or I mean, you also have to uh, essentially uh, the the curb cut's already there, yeah. so. You're not approving a second curb cut, um, and you can certainly um, address um, impacts uh, for screening. And um, I don't think we haven't talked about lighting yet, but um, those kinds of issues. But um, otherwise, you know, they're they're just asking to do the parking lot in a way that meets the standards, essentially. But the parking lot is allowed. Mark. Just a circuitous lap around this project. Um, so uh, there is no change of use of the building, um, and there's no uh, increase in demand in parking. Though they, the applicant is saying it, it's trending upward, and so they're trying to get ahead of it and and respond to the needs of the residents. But with site plan review, you could you could. You could argue that the future of parking is in cars downtown is going to be less and less. Um, with site plan review, could we restrict, for instance, uh, we'll go halvesies with you. We'll give you the parking spaces, the nine spaces that face the building, but the other nine across that face the residents, what's going to stop there? Are we, were we allowed that level of and the site plan review? If 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 the, there, if there is no change of use and there is no because of that, there's no, and, and they meet their re parking requirements now, then it hasn't been demonstrated why they need 18 more. They'd like 18 more, and their, their reasoning is sound, but, but it's, do we have to respond to that? Well, I, I mean, I think um, if, for instance, there wasn't enough room to provide an adequate buffer and a screen for the abutting parcels on that side where there are nine spaces, that would be a reason not to allow those nine spaces because there needs to be enough room for buffer. Um, but um, I, I don't see how there would be any other rationale for how you would deny the request for the number of spaces unless there was some other, you know, issue that it was a problem that it was creating for abutting parcels, you know, like drainage or something like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess if, <clears throat> I, I don't see how we could turn it down, but I would definitely require extensive planting, um, not just a screen, but 
right. And maybe maybe a fence and planting to um, maintain some of the amenities, some of the green feeling that it has existed for many, many years. Um, it, so I, I, you know, a combination of deciduous and evergreen trees, I don't know, but maybe they should come back with a proposal for kind of screening that would protect the abutters. I'm not sure how I would feel about a fence once you're talking about something that's really low because that's just blocking it off. <coughs> I'm not right. sure that's mm -hmm. solving anybody's problems. Yeah, I, mean, I think also you probably want to look at, um, you know, this comes back to snow removal again. Um, I think you'd, you'd want to also maybe address how that snow gets plowed because if it just gets pushed up against that property line, that's, that creates a nuisance potentially for the abutting as well. Well, they couldn't push it onto a budding property. No, but if they next to it in the right. winter, they're looking out their porch at a giant mound of snow. Well, and then, then but there's all also a fence that goes there. It could hurt the, it could damage the fence in between. Well, there's one other thing that hasn't been talked about, and that is that the parking places sized in the existing parking lot are, are obviously sized for uh, larger cars, as many elderly people in the past have continued to drive cars that they bought many years ago. So larger cars, are that, that lot is scale for that. Those are some of the widest parking places around. So the, they're meant for doors that can get open, wheelchairs that can get moved around. Um, I, I think there's more capacity in that parking lot than they're using uh, if staff is also using that parking lot too. Um, so I, I think that's another, I, I just wanted to plant that idea that there is, it sure looks like to me that with the size of cars that we have today compared to 20 years ago, um, I, I ask you to think about how many car spaces there are in something like River Valley Market where you've gone down to a 10 foot parking width. Um, the city has minimum widths and these are, many of them are 80 year old drivers so yeah, I mean, I, I recognize. Stop and shop has double striping between parking spaces. I recognize why you do it, but your staff is currently parking there, so you're giving that scale of parking space to the staff that's coming also. Right, and that's why we want to create parking on the back for staff. Any other thoughts at a quarter to 11? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm tr I'm, I think I'm struggling with the same thing that others are, is that it seems like planning should include things like character and um, things that maybe aren't quantifiable that are maybe more quali qualified and it seems it, I'm, it, it, I'm having difficulty just accepting that we just get to be sad and that there doesn't need to be some greater um, explanation of why it's required, that many spaces, and that a, a serious detriment to the neighboring residential properties is going to occur, and there's nothing that we can do about it. It doesn't make sense to me. And if that's how it is, and I should just shut up, I accept that, but it really takes brings me to a, a different decision about participating in the planning board. Any other thoughts? I mean, I think if <coughs> Carolyn's right and we can't affect whether this is scaled in any way or changed in design, then I think we ought to quickly switch over and start talking about how we can help mitigate it. But <coughs> I, I'd just like to say I'm really disappointed at, at this project addition to this place in town. Um, but could it be, could, could we scale it to half size? We can't, we don't have that. Right, so I mean, you've talked at various occasions about, you know, the possibility of having maximum parking requirements. Um, and there's only one place in Planned Village where there are maximum. So without a maximum, you know, um, uh, for parking, um, there's, there's no real teeth or jurisdiction to say mm -hmm. you can't have that parking. Okay, well. And I'll it may be, I mean, it's <coughs> probably good for a future conversation, um, but um, at this point, there's, 
the zoning doesn't have that. And there was nothing about when this was set up, there was nothing any place about open space. Well, I'm sure there was an open space, minimum open space requirement. And so right now at Urban Residential C, there's a 30% open space requirement there at 41%. Okay, so I think it's um, in into. Uh, I'd like to talk about a planting screen and what we can do to take the lights that are coming into this lot, Mark. Move to close public comment. Thank you. A second from John. So we've closed the comment portion for us to now discuss the project. Um, have to do all, all in favor. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> all in favor of closing yeah. public. I, I think we, we would benefit from being able to continue discussion. I actually have a question for the applicant. Is given that there's anyway, so okay. to deal with. Um, so I could be overruled by the rest. That's, uh, that's fine. Yeah, opinion opinion taken. But since I've already called for it, can we vote it down? Uh, all in favor of not closing public comment. Thanks. Um, <coughs> I have um, some concern about the sidewalk being necked down there. I don't, that doesn't feel right to me. I have an interest in getting the hedges uh, all around the front of the property so that, uh, you know, they're shielded from State Street and the sidewalk and uh, hedges uh, all along the north side of the property so that they're shielded from the residential neighbors. The curb cup's the same though, correct? It is. Right. I have a picture. So the sidewalk. No, I'm sorry. Did I say curb? The side. You said the sidewalk is being. Yes. That's how it is already. That's how it's right. existed. Right. Right. I have a picture if you'd like to see it. Well, I just when you said a three-foot sidewalk, I just I missed something in that. Um, yeah. I, I can show you. If it's I'm looking at the, it. Thank you. As the driveway curves down, so this this air, this right. part here. Okay. So now part I of it's the Now right I understand. Thank you. Um, Anyone else have anything? Just the, I mean, just, just the, the planting. Landscaping. Yeah, the landscaping. Yeah, I, I, I would just like to ask the applicant whether there is any willingness to scale back, understanding that we can't force that to happen, but that for the the common benefit. It are good to have, you know. To get to do nine spaces or to pick up a few more on that side, get 10 or 11, and, and keep some green buffer there for the residential neighbors. How about beyond? That's not an option. So it's just, it's. We, we could look at that, but, but again, as, as we explained in the application, more of the residents are coming with cars. We can't tell them they can't bring a car. And, and the lot is half empty a lot of the times, but it's full a lot of times. That's the only reason we're coming here. So if we built half of these, we'd be willing to consider that. We'd be willing to put a hedgerow up if we built them all to block the lights and make it a green buffer. <clears throat> but as more seniors bring cars, what we're gonna do is force them to park overnight in State Street. And, and we're just trying to it's not we're looking to the future, Mark. That's the situation now. As I explained, we, we just had 12 apartments turn over. We added four parking spaces. We've got five more in the next six apartments that get occupied. So we're quickly running out of parking on the site. Do you need an 18-foot space? I mean, is that city requirement? Everything we did is to the city parking and zoning requirement. any of the places where you can squirrel away you know single and double spots no beyond, beyond there it's all service it's service drive to get into the back of the building yeah. to get to the dumpsters if, if, if nine the nine spaces against the building became 12 or 13 and you eliminated the other nine would, would something like that work you know yeah. a couple like the sidewalk uh, yeah. yeah probably yeah. Yeah, truncate the site. So if you had 12 instead of 18, but, and, but they're all against the building instead of on the other side, mm. then you wouldn't need a hedge, you wouldn't need... Uh, we, 
you be willing to look at that? But what I would ask in consideration is that we will look at the design. It's going to minimize the stormwater, so we're going to have to redo calculations. We would really like to be able to get back and, and with the modified plan and get approvals so we can build it this winter if possible. So you've closed the hearing. We're willing to go back and make some amendments to our application, look at if we can minimize or eliminate anything on the northern side, add a little bit on the southern side and address some of the concerns that came from DPW and I'd like to be able to come back to you in two weeks. If and I'm add sure. some planting. Well, if well, they need parking they put it on the other yeah. side. It's just someone's so facing the building. There's, there's quite a few mature trees there now. So the issue is you close the public hearing, you right. can't accept new information. Right. But you could. No, no, we didn't, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't close the public here. Oh, you didn't. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I would ask maybe if you would continue to the yeah. next meeting, and we'll get back to you in plenty of time. Uh, and I guess I could have some hope that by keeping more of that green space where you were going to put the second row of parking, that may beneficially affect your stormwater story. Yeah. Honestly, I think we're improving the situation. It, it will reduce the amount of impervious pavement, but. The fact that we're directing the stormwater and treating it is going to definitely mitigate the problem coming from this property. We can't fix a problem at State Street. Right. We're going to do what we can to, to, to stop it. <clears throat> and then all of the pavement here, we're, we're making the situation better than what's there now. It just sheet flows over the wall. <clears throat> so, so you have a, um, just so you know, you have a, um, uh, you, only, you only have a sm uh, minor permit on the 22nd, so you have availability on the 22nd I to continue. I think we should hold this one in continuance mm -hmm. and keep our fingers crossed. Thank you for, yes. you for working with us. From yes, sir. May I be able to present new information on the 22nd if I discover it? Yes. Can he present? Sure. Yeah. Yes, it's still in the same status as we are right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Appreciate so it, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I move to continue this project to okay, 7 30. 30. 7 30. All in second. second by Tess. Okay, who moved? Ann. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Next one. I'm, I think I'm going to have to excuse myself. Um, get a butter, a good friends of mine, to represent them when they just met. I've been swelled tonight. It's late. Uh, they, I mean, I wouldn't feel right. Um, I don't think they're here. I've talked to them about it. Okay. Um, it seems like to me you would have to... <laughs> Alan, would you, uh, as soon as we open, say that and recuse yourself? <clears throat> so I'd like to open a hearing on an amendment of cluster special permit by City of Northampton, Glendale Road, Lawrence Map ID 41-32. Did you ask? Is that the one for 8 o'clock? <laughs> Yes, that's the one for eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. No, it's yeah. actually eight o'clock hearing. It's okay. actually the eight twenty. The eight twenty. Oh well. Oh, eight twenty. Hardly. Well, yeah. In that case, no problem. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay.
Thank you. Uh, so Wayne Feiden, I'm with the planning office. Um, I'll try to walk you through this quickly and understanding that it's late. Um, so we deal with the property on Glendale Road. Some of you were probably on the planning board four or five years ago when we approved it for a 24 lot subdivision. Um, so this property has frontage on Glendale Road, um, about 60 feet in one spot, um, 90 feet in a different spot, and then 700 feet of frontage along West Hampton Road. Um, so this property's been before the board like clockwork every year for about um, 28 years. So 1990 is when it came before the board the first time. Um, but they seemed to get really serious uh, about four or five years ago when you approved a 24 lot subdivision on the project. So they did, you know, did the full design, got a stormwater permit, wetlands permit, site plan and special permit, and subdivision permit. So this project before you is what you all approved at the time, the subdivision permit is still in effect, so they could build the road, as, assuming they did the final construction drawings before you. Um, the city took an option on the property, so we don't want to build this, these 24 lots. We want to basically, we're asking you to amend the permit to go from 24 lots to four lots, uh, and that's what I'm going to describe in a little while. So just quickly, we looked at various options. So. The developer has the right to build 24 homes. We all know that roads are very expensive, and so developers aren't building a lot of roads out there. Um, and so we looked at this. There's just a quick sketch, but what was a likely private sector solution if we didn't buy the property? So if we didn't buy the property, we think it's very likely there would be six homes on a looped cul-de-sac or a looped driveway off of West Hampton Road, six homes on a looped driveway, common driveway off Glendale Road and one home by itself. Those 13 units would be very easy to permit um, and you wouldn't have to build any roads. So those are sort of the two scenarios. Um, when we started looking at the property, we looked at what potential we would do seven homes, basically the, the homes on the sketch that are on Glendale Road. The benefit for doing seven homes is infrastructure would be very little and in essence the lots could have financed protecting most of the property as open space. Um, but we knew there was very strong opposition from the neighborhood when the subdivision came forward a few years ago, and so we decided there's more lots than we wanted to do. So um, instead, this is the proposal that's before you, which is to preserve uh, 53 and a half acres as permanently protected open space and carve out four lots. And the four lots are far away from the wetlands, um, far away from the bad soils, so we don't need any wetlands permit. We're going to be we're below the stormwater threshold. We don't need a DPW stormwater permit, um, and it has a minimal impact on the site. Um, and so this is, in essence, what we're left with. The, the large parcel of land in this is the 53 acres, which becomes permanent open space. The upper right-hand corner of the property is, this is the zoom-in, creating four lots. So there's a very small lot that's there. 4,000 square feet, which we're going to donate to the neighbor who would be most impacted by, by this. And then we do four, do these four lots. So this is our preferred project. We started with an earlier version. We had several meetings with the butters. Um, one of the butters who was most affected, sort of, I guess, four immediate butters and then the neighborhood in general. We've made a few changes from the version you had in your package, and so that's what I'm presenting tonight and that's what's in this package before you. Um, we increased the buffer for the driveway on the south part, so it's 10 feet further from the nearest home. Um, we, we addressed some drainage changes, so we don't have water pooling next to the driveway. Um, we had one butter who asked what would the cost be if we gave up lot one. So this is our preferred development. One of the butters was very concerned about lot being one being developed, and so we priced it out. We said to get four homes, to take the three lots further back and not use lot one, what would the extra cost be? Because we need to make the common driveway a lot bigger, we need to do a very different permitting process, and so we presented that number of what would the cost be. So we've been trying to work with the neighbors, sometimes successfully in terms of moving things, sometimes not so successfully in terms of not doing it. Um, and then this is the site plan. You have a version in front of you that's probably a little bit easier to read. Um, but so in essence what there is is there's a common driveway off of Glendale Road. That common driveway is 20 feet long, going back for 25 feet. 
and then it narrows to, 20, to uh, 15 feet up to the first and second lot, and then it narrows to 12 feet after that. So that, that all meets the common driveway standards. We're not asking for any waivers there. Um, and then that, the northerly house has its own private driveway. It's the city's goal that we buy that 53 acres, we add it to the Mineral Hills Conservation Area, and it's permanently protected. We buy these four lots, and we immediately flip them and donate them to Habitat for Humanity, so they'll be building it. Each of these lots show a small footprint of a two-story home. Habitat wants, so the footprint is about 650 square feet, or 750 square feet, excuse me. Um, Habitat wants to do one of them as a one-story accessible home. So one of the homes, probably the one in Glendale, but that'll be up to them, will be a slightly different footprint than you see on the plans just to make it fit in one story. The disturbed area doesn't change. Our calculations for disturbed area shows the house, the septic system, the driveway, and a cleared backyard. So even if the house configuration changes slightly from here, we still are staying below that, that one acre threshold for the, for the property. Um, and then just basically the site plan just zoomed in a little bit more on the site. Hopefully this is a little bit easier to read for you. Um, but again, you know, trying to, to keep every, the impact of all the driveways as minimal as possible, as short as possible, trying to keep the homes as close to either the road or the common driveway as possible to minimize the amount of asphalt. Habitat's um, program is they don't do basements um, and they don't do garages. So we want to make sure we can show where two cars are parked here, but again, it means a minimal imprint in terms of the size of the, of the building. The homes will be either two or three bedrooms. Again, that's going to be up to them to, to figure out what that is. Um, uh, so I just want to go through the, your criteria very quickly. I'm trying to race through this given the late hour, but obviously you can ask whatever questions you want. But so, so one of the criteria is conformant to the comprehensive plans, Sustainable Northampton. So a few slides quickly walking through them. So one of the goals in Sustainable Northampton is maintaining a clear distinction of rural areas and requesting that housing in rural areas should be cluster development to the extent possible. This is obviously a cluster project. Uh, goal for preserving the environment is to preserve the valuable and sensitive uh, resources and ecological receptors. We are hundreds of feet from any of the wetlands. Um, there is a estimated uh, rare turtle species on the site. We're also far away from that, so natural heritage has supported this application. So we're, we're meeting all those goals. The, the part of the site where we're building the homes is least valuable from a straight ecological standpoint, and it already has homes aboard, abutting them. And then obviously, we started this project as an open space project, so we're clearly meeting the open space goals of the sustainable plan. That's why, that's why we started the project in the first place. So we're preserving 53 acres out of the 55-acre site. And then the housing section of the Stand North Hampton plan emphasizes affordable housing. Um, and so we're doing a couple of things here, obviously creating affordable housing, but in particular, we know that a lot of the government programs, the vast majority of the government programs, have focused on rentals, which is critically important. We support the rental, affordable rental housing on Pleasant Street, but there's still a need for first-time home buyer home ownership. And so this is one of the few opportunities for, for doing it. Um, and one of our goals is to, to really spread out affordable housing throughout the city. So the biggest concentration is close to downtown where there's buses and things are walkable. But we also don't want to have neighborhoods, some that have lots of housing, affordable housing, some that have any. So this fits that right now there's no affordable housing on Glendale Road. There is a small habitat project around the corner on West Hampton Road. Um, and then I'm just going through the numbers quickly. If you remember, you haven't had a cluster for a while. So if you remember, you changed the zoning four or five years ago. Um, that the main requirement for a cluster is we look at the requirement for entire project. So minimum lot size for the entire project is four acres. We obviously have 55 acres. For the entire project is 175 feet of frontage. We have over 750 feet. Um, for the entire project is 200 feet deep. We have 1,200 feet, although it varies dramatically around the property. And the entire project um, is, uh, sorry, I this backwards, uh, is 85%, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we have a, a 80, a well over 85% open space. I guess we have less than 2% being developed, so sorry about that. Um, so the standards for the lots, there is no minimum lot requirement, minimum lot size requirement. There is no minimum frontage requirement. And there's only setbacks from the edge of the project. The requirement for setback is 20 in front, in front, 
15 on the side and 20 in the rear. These are four of the four lots themselves. We chose to require 20 feet on all the properties, so we'll be selling the property with those deed restrictions. So even though we only have to be 15 feet from the property boundary, we'll be selling and saying the houses have to be 20 feet uh, from them. Uh, and then finally, for the common driveway, um, we're allowed to have a maximum of three homes, and that's what we're showing. Um, had we gone through the scenario we dropped lot one, we would have had to go to the zoning board for a comprehensive permit. We want to avoid that, so we're not asking for any waivers for this being affordable housing. We're doing exactly a project that any developer could do if it was all market rate. Um, and then we, we meet the dimensional requirements to come to it. And then finally, um, as you know, there's a, a traffic mitigation requirement, but you specifically have authority to waive that traffic mitigation requirement when you do the same number of units by right. Um, and so with the frontage along West Hampton Road, someone could do four homes by right. Um, and in fact, if you did four homes on West Hampton Road, you'd have four driveways in a really unsafe, frankly, blind curve on West Hampton Road. We're instead doing two driveways. Glendale Road has its traffic problems. There's no question about that. People drive too fast. But two driveways on Glendale Road is a lot safer than, than four driveways on West Hampton Road. Um, and then finally, this is just conceptual, but we wanted you to understand sort of where this fits in. So the property to the left of this is an existing conservation area, so we currently call the ridge. We're in the process of rebranding it as Mineral Hills Conservation Area. The reason, you know, since I've been in Northampton, we've tripled the amount of open space, but we have the number of conservation areas because we're sort of merging them together, and so we deliberately want that message is connected. So this property become an addition to the existing, what's now the ridge becomes Mineral Hills Conservation Area, and you can see a trail network on this property. That trail already exists on the ridge. A portion of it exists on this property. We'd be filling in the gap for, on this property as well. So what's that? They'll, they'll connect? They'll connect, that's correct. Um, so that's the quick version. This is, we, as long as I've been on board, we've been talking about this um, mm -hmm. and thought it, we signed off on it four or five years ago with whatever it was, 20, you know, 24 lots. So this to me is, it's a home run in, in many ways. Okay. There are butters who are both in favor and opposed. I'm sure they want to listen to them. I think we'll hear them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you we open public comment? Mm -hmm. And seconded by Tess, all in favor? Anyone want to speak on this? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read it off because I have to be at Bradley Airport. I'm 1130 and I've already called to say we're going to be late. But that's okay because this is important to me. Um, I have to say what's being presented this evening is the right way to go. The 24 houses, I did not agree to it as a city councilor. There was a huge outcry against that project. Also, with the septic system that was put in place with the 24 houses was feeding all these 24 homes and I'm into environment and I didn't agree with it and plus the wildlife was being affected. So let me just read what I have and then I have to leave, okay? <laughs> On May 5th, an order came- Would you like for me to read it? Counselors recommended by the Mayor in Planning and Sustainability to approve the purchase of 55 plus acres on Glendale Road and West Stanton Road for $450,000. That was the first reading and it was approved by all of us city councilors. On May 19th, city council approved the second reading to give the city our approval to purchase the property and move forward. And they did. On August 18th, an order came again to City Council recommended by the Mayor and Planning and Sustainability to give authorization for four lots and affordable housing on Glendale Road and all councilors approved that first reading. Our Director of Planning, Wayne Fleiden, met with the Dyer of Butter, and believe me, the Dyer of Butter, who will have such an impact on their property, and they were with the 24 houses, but because of Wayne stepping right in right away and working with them, it has been really successful of trying to give them a good quality of life. 
I called Wayne and he met the three of us after he had that first meeting on site where the impact will be. Wayne worked very close with the abutters. I then, as a city councilor, set up a meeting with Wayne with the abutters again, and another abutter across the street who was interested, apparently, in Lot 1. I had Wayne work with me on setting up a meeting with me and for all the neighbors on Glendale Road in Brisson and Park Hill Road extension for September 2nd on a Friday at 6 o'clock p.m. And as long as I've been a city councilor, I've always done that. That's my process, okay? Knowing that we're gonna be coming to planning, which uh, a resident did tell me when it was scheduled. So I called Wayne and said, when we need to go ahead and we need to show the transparency and work with our residents who are abutters or any of the neighbors of concerns. So we did immediately. I went out and put flowers on every door on Glendale Road, on Brinson, and Park Hill Road Extension. Anyways, um, on September 1st, the order came back for its second reading and was approved by all city councilors. There was some opposition at the public hearing at city council about the percentage of affordable housing in the city versus the state and versus the, the rising that we have on a percentage, which is fine, everybody has rights to ask. And um, also, lot one was in question by an abutter across the street, okay, because he had bought his house three years ago and apparently it's wooded and he likes seeing the woods and so forth like that. So as a city councilor, I had to make sure that his concerns on that meeting that we had on that Saturday morning that Wayne sit down with him and work whatever out. And I don't get involved in that part of it. But anyways, after that second reading was approved, we set up another meeting with an abutter and we walked the property with them. And that's the one that one of the um, board members had to leave. They just bought their home like about three months ago. And um, both the doctor and his wife, they were very, very pleased with Wayne and I coming out there and walking the property with them because transparency and visibility is so valuable. And when you don't know what is happening, they did not even know the impact of 24 houses plus we're putting in four and living and set their houses set back. Wayne was able to show them exactly where the septic system was gonna go and so forth like that. Everybody loves woods. You cannot sometimes stop development. And there's no question about it. But this development with four houses, I do. And I will support that 100%. After we did that second reading that was approved, we set up another meeting in which I just explained. We also set up a meeting with all the residents, and that was a process that I believe in, and which is very valuable for all the abutters who would be affected in that area. Wayne and I listened on that Friday evening of all the questions and all the answers which Wayne, and I have to say answered with very dear respect and complete showing everything about what was going to be designed on the four lots and so forth. And I also have to say that I wanted Habitat for Humanity to be invited. So Wayne did get a hold of them so they could be at that meeting with us and I want to very, very closely with MJ Adams and Ward 6 from Habitat. We also had affordable housing, first one on Caroline Terrace. I had a uh, family, three small children, very children go to our schools, and they both, both parents work. Also on Ryan Road, we have a two family, which I also was involved until we changed the result, I mean the redistrict.
Then on West Stanton Road, we have six condos there, and we only had one person who apparently um, had passed away. It under affordable housing. They're like a little family. I do have to say on Glendale Road, they are also a very close, close neighborhood, just like many of my streets on my ward. And I, I have to say that I'm gonna support this 100%, definitely 100%, because I also feel, and I wrote down about the 50 acres, 50 acres of preserving open space, and I love wildlife. By conserving our open space, we are showing our dedication to wildlife and to protecting our natural treasures for all to enjoy. And that's from my heart because I'm for wildlife. I want to thank the planning board for having this hearing on this special permit to be granted. Please look at what has come forth. Affordable, four houses, single family homes. There is such an outcry as a city council. I have attended so many hearings in so many years of affordable housing and this is what should be placed there. And I wanna thank you very, very much. Thank you, Councilor. Thanks. Any other public comment? Well, my name is Stephen Childs. I'm a resident of 209 Glendale Road. Um, I lived there for about 18 years and I'm concerned with the future and planning of my neighborhood. Um, there's currently on the table a new solar array this um, four unit housing complex and there's rumors of a dog park going right in my backyard. Um, there's a ton of infrastructure concerns that I have, including the road itself. It's just not wide enough for the extra cars. The water pressure is already an issue. Um, and I just think it's gonna have a overall negative impact on the neighborhood. Um, the plan as a whole just feels rushed and incomplete. And I think it's gonna change the feel and um, look of our neighborhood as well as negatively affect the rights and privileges of those of us that already live there. Um, I guess I'm here to say I'm not in opposition of this project. I think it's great that we're reducing it from 24 homes to a maximum of four homes, but I just wish that we could have been considered as residents and taxpayers in the planning process of this project. There are many concerns and I, I really don't feel like any of our questions have been answered. Um, we have water runoff issues already. There's pooling on our street. Our street is in terrible condition, and I just don't see how we can afford to put eight more cars every day, plus the cars from the walking trails on our street. Um, I would welcome the opportunity to be included in any further meetings and uh, discuss this issue further. Thank you. And by your street, you're referring to Glendale Road. Glendale Road, Road yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next. My name is Donovan Tiffany. I live at uh, 122 Glendale Road, which is the lot um, adjacent to uh, lot one. Um, yet again, I agree with the amendment to the permit. I think the permit for the maximum of four housing lots on Glendale Road is good. Um, I love the conservation land. I moved to this particular corner of town because of the openness, per se, or the lack of cluster housing as this seems to be. Um, some of the neighbors and myself expressed some desires for some other options as far as how these four houses get four houses get laid out. Um, I did work with Mr. Fiden and met with him a number of times and discussed other possible options. Um, he did um, give me another option um, about possibly um, donating um, lot one. Um, up for purchase, but um, it would be at a minimum of $60,000 donation, and the proposal allows for a parking lot and potential for that land on lot one to be made into lot two. And when my intentions were to donate the land to preserve it for conservation land, I have no problem with the parking lot for the potential trails that are going to be leading off from there. Um, I just have concerns with a minimum of a $60,000 donation for conservation land that potentially I have written up here won't become conservation land. Um, I just, uh, 
I guess my overall concern is that um, there are other affordable housing um, projects going up in town and it's a combination of lots that are going to be f on the market for sale and houses that are going to be affordable housing. Um, I was kind of looking for this project to have a similar option. Um, and I guess my proposal, um, it included a, uh, I guess, uh, replanning um, for the four lots to maintain four building lots at this site. And um, a lot of apparently that $60,000 donation would be to revising the plan and constructing the, or getting the proper permit to put four houses on a common driveway. And um, I'm not really, I, I, so I appreciate that option. I just, I guess I was more looking for the, an option of maintaining the plan as it lies with three homes back there, but leaving lot one to be undeveloped or put on retail market so it can be purchased and possibly donated. And, you know, I would have say in something that I was donating at that point. Um, the proposal has no guarantees on it. Um, you know, um, the time frame in which I have to come up with this money is a little bit tight. Um, I'm mainly here concerned with the neighborhood and the driving down of the road and there's wooded lots along the way in between the houses and I understand the common driveway leading around back to three homes there um, but I just feel as if lot one is constructed the clear visible view of all the other homes behind it will be seen while driving down the road and I just you know it's something I gotta stare out of my window um, you know that's you know where I'm coming from but as far as people driving down the road I, I don't want to look like we live in a clustered community um, you know all our houses have plenty of frontage um, this one house on lot one only has 80 feet of frontage um, and I just uh, like I said I, I full faith in the whole conservation land and I believe in the affordable housing is just um, I'm looking for equal opportunities as other projects have for someone to come in and try to preserve something or do something of their own. Um, I just don't feel like all the options were thoroughly uh, discussed due to the time frame in which we uh, received information about uh, what the proposed plans were. Thank you. Thank you. Another comment? My name is Megan McDonough. I'm not a Northampton resident, but I am the executive director of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. Uh -huh. um, and we submitted a response to an RFP to be the developer for this project. And it seemed like a good fit for our goals of providing single family housing to people who are not otherwise able to achieve that dream of home ownership. Uh, we would be targeting homeowners below 60% of the area median income for the initial purchase and permanently protecting the housing with a deed restriction so that when the house is resold, it, there's a maximum resale price that would be affordable going in the future. Um, so I just wanted to put forward that I'm happy to answer questions and that we really support the city of Northampton going to bat for affordable housing and thinking creatively when looking at conservation land in cooperation with housing. So thank you. Any questions for? Okay. That's right. Thank you for staying as late as you have. I don't love this project, but I like it. I certainly like it better than I like 24 houses. I think we all sort of agree to, um, to that. I think the biggest difficulty, and for those people who are most heavily impacted, uh, is the house, the lot one, up against the road. What's increasingly happening to our corner of town is we're getting tighter and tighter and tighter along corridors. And yeah, we have a lot of open land, and hopefully this project and your refusal of some of the others that may come to you in the next little while, um, what's happening to that open land is no one can get to it. And that's because we're tightening ourselves up against streets. We're tightening ourselves, in this case, up against Glendale, which is already really tight. The roadbed at some point is going to need to be replaced. People stop on that road and think something has broken on their axle because they're sort of going like, you've probably all been to the dump, you're familiar with it. Um, 
I want to thank the amount of not just the people who worked on this project, but these folks gave up their Friday night on Labor Day weekend, and at that Friday night me meeting, volunteered to come back the following morning when the questions were so, when there were so many questions, um, to come back on that Saturday morning again on Labor Day weekend. So, I, and the reason they did that is because this is a really responsive community, um, and by that I mean our our little corner <laughs> in the, the southwest corner there. Um, I agree with the previous speakers that it would be great if there was a, a, another process by which we could have found out about this immediately, but that's how much this neighborhood cares about what's going on, and it is, is we gave up all of our weekends too. We're here tonight, we, right? Some of us have been here for many, many hours, as you have. Um, I agree that I would like to see something else happen to lot number one, but I'm very much for four houses and I'm very much for the Habitat for Humanity. So I would ask the Habitat for Humanity to bear in mind that what you're about to build is about 25% larger than the houses all around it. These will literally be the nicest houses in our area. They won't have garages, but that's the trade-off. Um, and hopefully everybody will be, be able to get their mind around that. But if, as they're putting these in, they could just really think about the impact that they're going to have on the frontage up against the road when the dump or the landfill comes right up to the road with its um, fencing, it just mentally, psychologically, um, and visually becomes more and more distracting. So please, if there's anything you could do to mitigate the harm to not just the abutters, but the roadway itself. That would go a long way towards um, making us feel continually accepted. Thank you. Yes? I wasn't gonna talk. This is, I'm Marcia Fellows. I'm on 23 Glendale Road. We're the ones that are gonna be highly affected with three houses behind us, a, ho a house beside us, in the common driveway on our left. So we're impacted both sides in the back. Wayne and Council LaBarge have been very good about coming to us and asking what we'd like. And our, our thing is, is privacy and drainage. We've talked to Habitat for Humanity. We have a good rapport. I think we can work with them. If, th if something could be done with lot one, we'd be dancing in the street. We're not opposing this. We're, we went to every Kensington meeting, you can think, since 1990, and we didn't miss a one. Uh, the developer actually gave us fencing all around. He was going to give us lot one, give us lot one, $4,000, fix our drainage, and a curb opening. And this is, was all legal with lawyer and et cetera. It was kind for the city to give us that buffer and back, but it's overgrown with trees and etc. It's a nice <coughs> gesture. When Wayne showed me plans, I don't understand why the driveway was right on our line, and it's and it's true you can do that in the city, but you know uh, we have a woodshed maybe four feet from the line, so when you blow snow, it would go into our woodshed. To me, I didn't understand that, but Wayne worked with me and moved it over 10 feet from our line. Uh, Jerry and I decided not to be the bad guys in this proposal, but how could you give, you know, 24 houses are going away and you're gonna have wildlife and a nice corridor up there. We do have issues with lot one. It's gonna be, we have 15 feet, Wayne has guaranteed us 20 feet, but it's gonna be right there. The three houses behind are great. Uh, we don't oppose this, we just, you know, want to work closely with the city, closely with Habitat Humanity, and so far we haven't had any problems. I just wanted you to know we are there. We're not jumping up and down. Um, we enjoy the wild, you know, it's going to be wildlife back there. It's going to still be uh, woods and et cetera. There, it's old woods. It's starting to fall apart. I just hope that the big pines around us are considered, the drainage is considered, and that things will be our privacy and boundaries is, is all we're asking. And I hope they're good neighbors because we have barking dogs, we have parties. <laughs> so we hope things will uh, work out because our neighborhood, we're all pretty, all close. We range from different ages. 
uh, we have uh, an agency, maybe two houses down. I don't know if it's ServiceNet or what, but they're good neighbors. We have all types of personalities on our street. We all get along, so uh, I, I understand where my other neighbors are coming from, and they have a right to speak. There was a lot of things about rights and what was said, and the drama was getting out of hand, and it's just people have a right, like the quarterback who, who won't rise for the national anthem, it's his right. The repercussions may be exaggerated, you know, may be harsh on him and et cetera, but people have rights to speak what they feel is in their heart. We are not opposing this. We are happy. Kensington Avenue, uh, Kensington Estate was a big mistake with one septic system, so we're happy with the trail and thanks to Wayne Fine and Councilor Botch, and thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Uh. Good evening. My name is Richard Lopardo. I live at 74 Glendale Road. Uh, I'd like to just go on record that I'm opposed to this project. Um, there is an established trail already going through Lot 1 out and connects to all those other trails out in that conserved land. Um, and I can see why, you know, we're uh, Donovan Tiffany, his house happens to be directly across the street from that trail. He has a dog. I have dogs. Uh, there's a number of other neighbors in the that have dogs, and we all use that trail. Uh, that trail happens to go through every single yard that they have planned on putting in through there. Um, there's a lot of other concerns too, but it's getting late, and I don't want to go through it. They've already said it, so I'd like to just say thank you and. Have a good night. Thanks for staying with us. Have we heard from everyone? Thank you. Uh, we might want to get yeah. questions to Wayne. Um, do we have questions for Wayne? I, I just have one. Uh, regarding Lot 1, I mean, most of the, if not all of the negative comments centered on Lot 1, so can you just walk us through an abbreviated uh, walk on, on we have three lots because you can only have three serviced by one driveway right and so we but why the need for lot one I guess why, why not just three so I guess there's three reasons so we went we went to council the first time council was very clear that besides the affordable housing piece you know one of the things we've said every time we buy we buy about 150 acres of land a year mm -hmm. council is always concerned about are we taking land out of development and then artificially inflating the price of housing, even for market rate housing? And so they've asked us when we do a acquisitions to look at, do we have opportunities to create some building lots even when we're preserving land? Um, and so we went from seven units to four units because that really made sense for mitigation. Um, but four seems to fit in with the neighborhood. The density lot one is the size of some of the homes on the street. Um, and so it's not out of character for the area. And obviously, it's the least expensive one to develop. So this, right. the sixty thousand dollars of dropping lot one and adding an extra lot, is really to pl to, to cover the change cost for doing it. So okay. we want it, I guess, really for three reasons: to create building lots, we're not artificially inflating the, the price of land; to create an affordable housing lot, and just you know having more of them, um, and just straight financially. The way this, you know, we, we have to come up with two hundred thousand dollars for the land, and it's divided up between. <coughs> basically selling these lots internally. So we have a community yeah. development block grant that's paying $200,000 for the four lots. They were doing grants and fundraising for $250,000 the back lot. Okay. So we would have an extra gap in our funding if we dropped it. And specific to lot one, can you do a quick uh, before and after of the, the 24 lots that were approved before that impact on lot one versus this impact? Yes. Yeah, so Lots two, three, and four are essentially the same as three of the lots in the development. Um, so in this version, let me just come over here if I can. Yep. Eight, nine, ten, the ones up there are almost in some very minor changes to what we have here. Then we're dropping 21 lots. Lot one was not going to be developed before. It was going to be split in half. The northerly half was going to be part of permanently protected open space to provide a trail to the backland. 
um, because it was a cluster as well as so they're required to that. And the southerly half was going to be donated to the neighbor as well. Is that a wooded lot right, right now? It's densely wooded, yes. I think that would be very important to try to maintain as much of that as possible for the building, to screen the building and, and to sort of, um, I'm interested in, in maintaining that as much as possible. So if you look at this plan, this is the cleared area on this plan. You see that, that jagged line, line is what can be cleared on the site. Yep. So we'd be clearing to the rear of the septic system, and that's approximately, and just eyeballing this, but a little bit less than 40% of the lot. So 40% of the lot, habitat may choose to save a tree or not, that's not required, but 60% of the lot will be untouched. And are there plans to make a trail that would connect back into Mineral Hills? Yes, but not on the northerly part. So on the southerly part, so we, there's a finger of land that's 60 feet wide, had this been, I should ask, answer that as part of your question. Mm -hmm. Had this been a 24 unit project, that would have been the road right away, 60 feet. As it is, the northerly 30 feet of that is a right of way which the driveway would be in the center of. The southerly 30 feet will be retained by the city for a trail. Um, and so we do a trail back there. And then mm -hmm. on this final version, I don't know if you can see from where you are, but there's two blue lines. So we have a trail that comes out to Glendale Road and we have a trail that comes out to West Hampton. Okay. Any other questions for Wayne? No. Do I hear a motion to close public comment? Close by Ann, seconded by Mark. All in favor? Any other comments about the project? I mean, I, I get the concern by the abutters, um, but again, this is, we're going back on something we approved that I think universally everybody agrees is is 10 times better than yeah. uh, no exactly before. six times better yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think with the concerns that the abutters noted I, I, I think there's certainly more pros than cons and so I'm in favor of it anyone else may make a comment can I get a motion I move to uh, approve the amendment of clusters uh, special permit by the City of Northampton, Glendale Road, Florence, Map ID 41-32. Second. Second by John. All in favor? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for staying with us tonight. It's been a long night. I, I, you gave it all up. Thank you. So, Les, do you think you can no, leave? No, we can. Yes, we can leave. I, you need to do one administrative um, act, two administrative acts, and the, um, the, it's not me asking. It's been sitting in the audience all night. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, just because you've been sitting in the audience all night, I'm, I'm plugging for doing this one now. I, I would have had a really we different have attitude. We on Tuesday, which we're really counting on having your Okay. This involves signatures from everybody twice on all these sheets. I have two pens, <laughs> so start signing. <laughs> so officially, tell you me have what we're to, doing. This is um, Northview Pecoy, that last subdivision. So these are the mylars. They can't start construction until these are recorded. They also have to um, have a performance guarantee in place. They've um, suggested to put a covenant on all the lots to start with. Um, we Staff needs to review the final covenant language, but you just need to sign off that. Um, we've reviewed the amount. It's $810,000 and change um, is the value of construction. So they're um, 19 lots. No, 12 what, lots. Uh, 21. There's, well, minus there's three, three out on Ford Crossing. Right, right, right. So 18 lots in the subdivision that will be held as um, guarantee against, you know, the construction. So I'm going to unroll this, and I'll unroll another one over there. And maybe as you sign, because it's required by law. <laughs> We've so, done this before. It never um, so you sign here. Maybe you missed the last one. Um, a majority of the planning board has to endorse this the subdivision plan so you're signing here and wait I have special pens 
Yes. Because it's well, my life. Well, if you have a Sharpie, you can use a Sharpie. I'll buy you one. Okay. Retractable <laughs> Sharpie. Okay, so maybe you have more sharpie. pens. I have two Sharpies here. Um, and do you have a Sharpie? No. Oh, uh, Tess's right. got one. Well, I'll bring you. Is that okay? What's that? It's a fine tip. It doesn't matter. Oh, it's always a Sharpie. It is. Um, so oh, wait. Do you want to rotate? Is it wait, faster wait. to go do Are those the two sets in one? Two mylars in one? No, there's just one mylar set and then two hard copy sets. Is it faster to go mylar. and sign each sheet and turn it over mylar. or somebody come sign it? Um, but you know what? We can uh, just, how many the sheets one, are there? only one goes to record. The other Boy, I think to probably better to get all of us. So yeah, we, turn we could have yeah. the other yeah. one signed. That'll keep Dan awake anyway. Uh, Okay, is that going to allow us to go forward and record with just... Um, yes, but I'll need that mylar for the 22nd so these guys can sign the second mylar for DPW. Okay. Okay. Um, so what, one other request. If where we do we sign it? Uh, I think... With the, uh, with the closing that we have on Tuesday, will it be possible to get the mylar back and have the uh, covenant uh, reviewed in time so that I could pick it up on Monday? We'll try. Yeah, the cover sheet you can sign anywhere. Maybe if everyone sh signs in one location. Um, so and then the other ones, there should be a line, a signature line. So wherever there's, um, you know, this block of signatures. And we have to sign on each page? Yes. So I'll just move it down once you sign, right? Uh, sounds good. Okay. We're all gonna <laughs> You're going to get in line. Yeah, Got it. we Never were going to do everything. Everybody. You guys are lucky. You only have to be one set. Well, I'll use so, yes. Yeah, so I will. I so, just saw the Don't move it down yet. We're all going to get rid yeah. of it. I just, and okay. then, I just need to. I need more time. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I just. Uh, that. So um, I'll talk to you tomorrow, maybe? Or? Yeah, and actually, what I'll need, Devin, are you going to be in town? Um, this in the next couple days because I'll need you to sign as long as the board um, approves the covenant which I'll take a quick vote um, then you as chair will sign the covenant that will go to record that you then would take for a recording. Okay. Wait, Mark. Didn't take up too much space. Is it everybody or a majority? They have to sign every page. Anyway, it has to stamp it. My understanding. I was just. I figured I'd pick. I'd pick up the the covenant. I'll pick that up, and I need a certified copy of the. Yeah, from the clerk's office, which I'll arrange arrange tomorrow, and then maybe pick everything up on Monday if that works. So you want to go close Tuesday? Tu Tuesday morning at nine o'clock is the closing. So. On this sheet. Yes. So the lawyers will be after me all weekend. You know, where's yeah. this, where's that? Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, does somebody want to move to accept the covenant? So moved. Second by John, seconded by Tess. All in favor? Aye. No. Unanimous. Uh, everybody on this sheet? Nope. No. I'm going to number the sheet so I can keep asking that question. So this is number three. We'll start number two, four. So, but then when you do want to start releasing the lots, we'll have to figure out. Percentage you know, completed. Right, so let's yeah. start that <laughs> early enough in the process. Right, so I talked back from somewhere. I did. I did. Uh, we were in North Carolina for the last week or so. 
Did anybody hear He's about a the nice guy, truck? too. Here we drove halfway. We drove to Newark, Delaware last night, and we went till yeah. this morning. Yeah. 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 Yeah
And I'm doing a motion to adjourn. There's no reason we have oh, to be on the clock to be doing this. Then we could no. put no, tell no, her. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, motion, motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? <laughs> yes.